Hello and welcome back everyone, we weeb online and today I'm gonna start a new movie What If Itachi was Kojo's brother. If you enjoy this video, please give it a big thumbs up and to watch more videos like this, subscribe to my channel and turn that bell notification on so you never miss an upload. Now wasting no more time, let's begin. He became conscious. There would be nothing to it if it were any other situation or if he were any other person. Like puppets controlled by invisible threads, the majority of people close their eyes and open them again after five to six hours. Unlike other individuals, he was unique. The majority of people did not pass away, leaving behind blurry eyes and a sickly appearance and then wake up at some inexplicable later period. Though it seemed like an eternity, the pale gray eyes he was staring at the wooden beams over his head were actually only open for one hour, 24 minutes, and 56 seconds. He wanted to just explore his new surroundings, even if his senses urged him to roll off what his back told him was a futon. Nothing. He prayed it had finished because he was beyond fatigued, but he knew more than most people that hope was a deception. And yet, there he was once more, gazing up at a ceiling while understanding that this was reality. It would require Kami to use his genjutsu experience to trick his senses. He would have stayed there forever if left on his own, but as the dawn began to gently make its way into his chamber and drive off the reassuring shadows and darkness, he heard a faint knocking at what he took to be a door. A moment afterward, the door swung open, and a quiet, subdued voice greeted me with Jiki-sen. The family head would be displeased if he knew you're still in bed was the voice that continued to speak even though he remained motionless and tried to ignore it. This time, the voice also contained a hint of pain and dread, discomfort in the body. Lifting himself up on one supple arm, he gazed at the black-haired woman stationed at his room's entrance, idly noting her scant to non-existent muscular mass. He glanced at her again, slowly blinking, and determined that she was no longer a lady but a teenager based on her sparkling eyes, smooth cheeks and lack of wrinkles. She wore a one-piece black gown with a white fabric draped over it. He watched her silently, her head still bent. He stood up, his movements slow and unnatural. It would have taken months for anyone else to go from a 5'8 lethal physique born for battle to a three toddling mess of soft flesh and inadequate motor control. However, he was up and walking toward the teenager within 10 seconds, and he already knew how to handle it. His motions moved from jerky and uncoordinated to elegant and smooth, and there was hardly any sound from his bare feet on the wooden floor. She lifted her head and gave him a warm, familiar grin that made him think of his mother. Her smile was one that exuded tremendous love and kindness, a smile he repressed and set to bed for the sake of peace. He stopped right in front of her bowed head and muttered, I'm up. The teenager flinched back, as something must have read in his face. Then, in a strange ritual, he was brought to a bathroom and out of the house. As he stepped into the water-filled bathtub, he was met with a face he recognized yet didn't recognize. He narrowed his pupils, revealing his signature lines beneath his gray eyes due to the inconsistencies in the sentence. His waves of bone-white hair tickled his ears as it covered his unwavering expression of utter apathy. The maid lifted a pail of water and tipped it over his head, rolling up her sleeves in the process. He experienced feelings he had never thought he would have again. The remainder of the bath was a blur, ending with the maid giving him a towel, putting on a black and white checkered kimono and a white hakama, and covering his feet with beautifully textured wooden geta. He pretended not to notice the strange feeling of getting dressed and listened stoically to the maid's endless chatter. He discovered that he was a Gojo clan member and that, as it was his fourth birthday, he would be meeting the clan chief today. Additionally, his older relative had departed early to begin his second year at Jujutsu High. There was more calm and quiet on the trip to the clan chief, the maid giving him worried looks. Ignoring them, he took a step behind and to one side of her. He learned his house was on the edge of the clan estate, so they left it and strolled down the well-paved cobblestones that went to the inner compound. The traditional house in the middle felt more like a fortress than a home, so he disregarded the looks from his black-haired clan members and the odd white-haired one. The closer they approached, the more wooden his maid's looks, gait, and walking style became. 
They waited for a few moments in front of the door before she plucked up the nerve to knock. The doors opened gently after she hardly touched them. She paused there, looking at him with a mix of terror, desperation and beggarly eyes. Gray into black, he fixed his gaze on her eyes, trying to read what it was that she was shouting at him. When all of his attempts failed, he did the one thing he thought would calm her down. He put his small, pale hand into her grittier hands and gave her a quick squeeze. The grip that followed was natural to her. He nodded softly to her and went inside. The door shut behind him, trapping him within a pitch-black house. He waited, his eyes gradually adjusting to the darkness. The shadows posed no threat. It felt as reassuring as the touch of a mother. He was shaped by it, born in it. He lived in it for half of his life. It did not frighten him. His eyes adjusting to the darkness, he walked softly, slipping his feet and keeping his arms folded in the kimono. It took him a minute to go to the end of the hallway, where a door opened to a large room at the end covered with tatami mats. The sudden intense light in the room demanded that he blink, so he let his eyes drop to a half-lidded gaze instead. Bronze statues, each showing a man sitting in Siza with dramatic facial expressions ranging from insane smiles to wrathful ones, surrounded the room. Everyone gazed at the individual in the center while holding prayer beads. He sensed something malevolent coming from the man seated in the middle, even from a distance. Not so much chakra as an aura that hung over him, choking him to the point where he nearly lost consciousness. His sole reactions to the oppressive aura were wide eyes and a tightened breath. The old guy opened his eyes, looked at him, then nodded toward a mat that was right in front of him. He nodded in response, then moved over to sit down, tucking his legs under and resting his hands palm flat on his lap. The older man closed his eyes again, allowing him time to examine his face. With skin so pale that it seemed as though he hadn't seen the sun in decades, he had fighter-like muscles and a black kimono that fit him perfectly as he sat there without a wrinkle. His eyes moved to the statues all around them, listing each one's attributes. The man's eyes opened again just as he had begun the third, and he sent him a glare that captured his whole focus. Gojo Jiki, he said in a scratchy, hoarse voice. Do you want to be a sorcerer? The following two years of his life were affected by the discussion that ensued after he asked that question. With a limited understanding of curses, cursed methods, the three major clans, his family, and his role within them, he left the house. It also helped him understand why his maid was so afraid of him when he entered. His father, a somewhat resentful and mediocre sorcerer by the standards of the clan leader, named him Jiki right then and there because his birth had caused his mother's death. His mother passed away during childbirth. Eiko, his maid, looked after him for the next four years before to his waking. The teenager with black hair had reared him almost as if he were her own kid since birth and was afraid of the decisions that would face him as a Gojo clan member and a direct descendant of Michizane Sugawara. His status in the clan was significantly lowered as a result of the clan head's obvious lack of interest in him following his decision. However, he was not interested in returning to such a life. Compared to his previous world, this one was as close to being peaceful as he could have imagined. He no longer saw the need to lead the way. Reminiscent of his own days as the clan heir, his elder cousin carried the weight of the clan's once-in-a-century dejutsu and all its associated duties. Recollections he would have preferred to have forgotten about that damaged world. He studied a great deal about this new planet for the next two years in his clan's library. He had thought that this earth and the elemental nations were comparable, but now that he had seen the global map, the battles waged, the stories recounted, and the alliances forged, he was positive that he was far from the elemental nations. Even in his seemingly isolationist clan, he had easier access to technology than even the most powerful people in the hidden villages ever had. He tried to live a life he was never given the chance to live by occupying his days with unremarkable activities. From painting in the morning with Aiko to doing calligraphy and writing alone himself in the library surrounded by clan members who showed him little to no affection. He didn't like it though. Maybe the old bastard had that in mind when he started all of this any other child would have yearned for their family's attention. Not Itachi though. 
A new family's love was not something he deserved. Not after he'd killed his last to keep the peace. Not after what he'd done in the Anbu under the pretense of commander's instructions. No, Itachi didn't see the need to get to know this new family. In fact, he liked and benefited from their distance. Eiko was the lone bright spot in his gloomy world of indifference, anxiety, and terrible memories. Akko remained even closer to him than the majority of the clan who had moved on and ignored him. She was helping to bathe him when he painted her grin for the first time. It was as good as it could be, just like everything Itachi had attempted. Her dark hair, with strands that escaped at the sides and flowed in the gentle early morning breeze, was bundled up in a bun beneath a white towel. She said lovely nothings to him while washing his white locks, her hands drenched in suds. The brilliant smiles she reserved for him when they were together, the radiant glow of a happy lady who loved what she did. She accepted it after his first task, her eyes welling with tears, and she gave him a hug so strong that she could have broken his back if she had continued. The clan leader himself had left him with an aisle, a canvas with ultra-smooth, fine and coarse brushes lining the aisles, and an abundance of colors on the side when he woke up the following day. For the first time in a long time, he felt disoriented and had to reconsider the old man's judgment of him. Didn't he hate him for wishing to lead an ordinary life, for his daughter's passing? It was only after his second painting, of the bronze figures he had seen in the mansion, vanished from his aisle the next morning and reappeared on the doors of that obstructive dwelling that he realized his error. He'd instinctively thought the clan head was similar to the seniors of the Uchiha clan, trying to force the younger members into doing what they wanted. Who was more interested in a child's other skills than bloodlines, cursed ability, prestige, and combat prowess? Considering his excursions into the clan library, he knew most clans were like that. But it suddenly occurred to him that he never even gave his clan leader an opportunity. His human side was on display with the error. He wasn't perfect, despite Kanoha and the elders of the Uchiha clan's best efforts to make him so. He was just like the rest of us. An amused smile appeared on his face. A smile that vanished in a flash a moment later, revealed to be his maid brandishing what he later discovered was a camera. She left his workshop without saying a word, giving him a smile that was even brighter than he thought he could ever have. A few days later, he began to hear the whispers again the damned words that caused him so much agony in his previous existence. Prodigy genius. His clanmate's side looks shifted from indifference to curiosity. How many five-year-old kids could effortlessly replicate the stunning pictures and intricate artworks he created? In the end, he was able to move past it since the context was different, even though the phrases were same. No one was complimenting his intelligence here for figuring out the ideal angle to simultaneously cut a man's carotid and jugular at the same time. Here he wasn't dubbed a prodigy for his ability to instantly alter and sketch explosive tags. No, he was commended for his unremarkable painting skills. Typically, his work was visceral. Visions seared into his mind. A former existence full of enough terror to break lesser men, a blessing and a curse of the Sheringen. He was granted a modest building in the compound and beside it to exhibit his artwork, which included depictions of Yukigakure's everlasting winters and the blood-stained, gorgeous grasses of Kusigakure. He depicted island communities from the elemental nations, where the sun rose just once every two years for an unknown reason to the many summoning realms liminal and fluid qualities, the endless skies and unchangeable mountains that make up the hawk's home, to the perpetual obscurity of the crow's nest and the albino red-eyed matriarch sitting atop a dead tree, the splendor of the locations he visited during his years of traveling with the Akatsuki was going to be the one thing he brought back from his cursed origins, a straightforward inquiry that pointed to a future he could not have predicted or imagined brought an end to his years of happiness and mundanity. Horrible luck, fate, or a capricious chance. After a difficult day of practicing his calligraphy at the age of six, he looked up at his maid, Echo Chan, and asked her to do something that would forever alter his life. Sprang from the childhood recollections of running from cafe to cafe with Sasuke at festivals. In a quiet voice he said, I want to go to a cafe. 
After glancing at him for a moment, Eiko-san smiled gently and nodded. I'll see what can be done, young master. One week later he woke up, went about his daily business, and when it came time to get dressed, he was wearing a baggy black long-sleeved shirt and white shorts that ended before his knees, his hair tied into a bun at the back with only a few stubborn strands escaping it, instead of his usual yukatas, hakama, and Hayori. He gazed uncertainly at his maid, his feet dressed in black slides. She smiled, recognizing his surprise, and said, The head of the clan has granted your request. He trailed behind her from their home to the main gates of their compound, nodding softly. A compound where he had lived for the last two years. A man in a black suit waved at them from inside, a matching black automobile with a slight grimace. He understood why he was wearing a different set of clothes when he sat inside the vehicle as it passed the remote clan compound and entered the city. Not a single one of them was dressed in the formal attire of the rest of the clan, and to dress that way would have made the part of him that had spent decades hiding in the shadow's grimace. His head was turned when they stepped outside and entered a cafe, observing anything and everything. Seeing the images was one thing, but experiencing it firsthand was quite another. Tokyo had easily five times as many people living in it as any secret community he was aware of. There were tens of them across the nation, and this was just one city. As soon as he became aware of them, his sightseeing was interrupted. The majority of them were little, deformed-looking animals that were attached to particular humans. One larger one he noticed remained atop a structure, with four limbs that sunk into the stone like a hot knife through butter, twice the size of a horse, skin that was an odd blue, and an abundance of eyes that lined its back, seemingly fixed on him. It remained in one place and watched them enter the cafe. Eiko-san was pointing at everything that was on show, blissfully unaware of the beast. Boy bands on billboards, apparel, and other items. After giving it a quick inspection, the quiet and peculiar man in black led them into the cafe. Everything changed at their fifth place. They waited for minutes in line to be served, a peculiar kind of dango that Eiko-chan had assured them was delicious. After a brief talk with Eiko, their driver and escort left, their heads swiveled and a heavy frown on their faces since their fourth stop. He let something go by because he was so overwhelmed by this new encounter that he let his guard down. He first noticed what he recognized to be a spike of cursed energy from nearby, and then a blue blurred form appeared a step away from him. Subsequently, a person dressed in all black with frightened, wide eyes moved in front of him pushing him aside and vanishing into thin air. It took him a moment to comprehend what had transpired, for his enormous intelligence to sort through the specifics of what seemed like a moment. He felt anything for the first time in this new life, something that tore through his act of indifference as he observed the viscous consistency of recently leaked blood, drenching his white hair and splattering on his right cheek. He gazed at the crumpled, wounded and lifeless form along the side of a building. At the Polaroid photo that fell out of the fabric and into the blood splatter. A photo showing a boy with white hair and a gentle grin. In a previous existence, Itachi had been irate. He was furious at the circumstances that led to his clan's massacre. Furious that, in order to save his village, he had to collaborate with some of the worst people he had ever met furious at the route he had his tiny Ototo travel. However, he was ignorant of hatred. However, as soon as he felt it, he recognized it for what it was. Something about its purity caught my attention. When one emotion was the focus of the mind, body and soul, matched and coordinated. Nothing could stop you from terminating something, as far as you knew at the moment. You could accomplish your goals even if Kami came groveling on her hands and knees. The world might end and be doomed. That would snuff out all 30 million souls in the metropolis, and all you would feel would be the urge to fulfill a goal. For the first time in his two lifetimes, he experienced hate. It was as though a dam had broken inside of him. Hatred flooded through him, calling to him like an old friend. A swift procession that most would have missed, the crumpled form split and multiplied from one to three before folding on itself into another shape. 
It followed long forgotten pathways before leading up to his eyes, and the clarity of vision that came with the feeling burned the image of the crumpled form in black and white into his spinning pupil. He turned to face the curse, which had several eyes glaring at him, an arm outstretched to seize him, and skin that split vertically in the center of its face to reveal a voracious maw. Regardless of the cries and crowd movements caused by this invasion into their reality, this deviation from their predetermined lives script. With a single phrase, his throat went raw. A phrase, a declaration, an assurance, a directive. An order that he anticipated the world to turn over in order to fulfill. Die, he said, blood streaming from his left eye. It was a familiar jutsu. It sprang out of nowhere, like an unwanted kid being shown affection for the first time, and his visual powers eliminated the need for any hand gestures. Amaterasu possessed exquisite jutsu. At his best, he was a formidable attacker and defender who could quickly reduce practically anything to ashes if he so chose. However, he was not at his best, not even close. That along with the fact that the cursed creature was intelligent, regardless of its rank, or have sufficient instincts to imitate it. The moment the black flames started to bloom, it went from having its arm outstretched to leaping backward. He had gone for the head, but it was spared death by its introspective recoil at the sound of a cursed technique. The fight turned from a sure thing to a clear-cut drawn-out brawl. On its right hand, the heavenly brilliance bloomed, and black flames spread like liquid fire along its blue skin. The creature's never-ending fire was fed by his pure loathing for it. It stretched its other three arms, trying to crush him, and gave forth an inhuman screech. He promptly closed his left eye after noticing a discernible loss of his cursed vigor, which caused him to stumble back at the expense of the maneuver. It was a technique he never used lightly and never at the start of a fight, even in his previous life. It was Kami's hammer, designed to crush any dreams of victory. He was saved by the Sheringan's prophetic powers. This time, instead of only seeing the curse move as a blur, he watched the hideous fist aim for his head. The curse withdrew its hand, and he tipped his head backward, allowing his body to follow, nearly toppling over until his overused core muscles caught him midway and snapped him back up. The cursed energy shot through his body, strengthening his muscles, bones, and nerves as he twisted to the side to avoid one enormous fist the size of his torso. Considering his experience with chakra reinforcement, it was like a fish in water to him. He sidestepped to avoid an above hit that shattered the earth, hurled shrapnel at him, and scattered dust everywhere. He emerged from the dust with a straightforward jump back that was augmented by cursed energy. Just as he was standing up, a tail swipe emerged from the dust cloud. By pure accident, the curse was able to defeat an unskilled sharing in user by employing one of the best strategies available. He was unable to react quickly enough to avoid it because the dust obscured the tail's movement for a considerable amount of time. Despite his advanced skill in chakra reinforcement, this was a young, supple and sensitive body utilizing the method for the first time. The strain of strong reinforcement was too much for it to withstand, particularly in the way he employed Amaterasu. The pain in his muscles, the groan in his bones, and the pressure on his brain forced him to use mental sharpness that he was unable to maintain six seconds into the fight. The blow came down on him like a ton of bricks, folding him along the breadth of the tail as it slammed into his belly. Though he could hear his ribs creaking from the impact, he was not going to stop there. He noticed one snap in passing. Releasing it midair, he followed the attack's momentum while clinging on the tail. He took a moment to look at it high above the sky. The cloud of dust was settling. The flames reached the creature's neck. It had lost one hand and was about to lose another. It continued to roll around on the ground and thrash in an attempt to douse the flames. However, the black flames stayed near it, expanding and devouring everything in their path. Faster than any natural flame had the right to, yet slower than if he had purposefully fostered it. The short but intense high-speed combat caused his neatly styled bun to come loose, causing his blood-soaked hair to fly around him. With everything at stake, he retreated towards the beast. 
His left eye was open again, a second Amaterasu on its way, until an enormous axe struck it with such force that it created a shockwave and flew into a car, its viscera and entrails gushing out. Even with reinforcement, he felt the impact of the person slamming into the pavement at bone-rattling speed and was caught mid-air by a calloused hand that balled his small body. He glanced up at his savior and saw the driver's young face frozen in an expressionless frown. The man in the suit continued to stare at the curse as it emerged from the car's wreckage. It continued to scream incoherently as more of the black fire engulfed it. A guy who had fought in combat for half of his life was accustomed to the smell of burning flesh. The driver admitted that it wouldn't be transferring to him after expressing surprise at what he saw. He nearly dropped Itachi at the sight of his eyes when they met. Itachi shrugged a little, allowing himself to stumble briefly as the driver supported him with a touch on his shoulder. Sensing the second person, he looked over his shoulder. Mao Mao, you Gojo sure are breeding terrifying monsters this generation. Takumi Sanbil is definitely going up. The woman with light blue hair approached them, axe resting on her shoulder. Her eyes squinted as she spoke. Blood spattered the hems of her long black skirt. The driver tightened his hold on his shoulders. He continued to stare at the woman, disregarding the driver next to him, saying, what terrifying eyes on such a beautifully crafted face. How would you like to model and make us some money, eh? The woman fell to a squat to stare at him, her face beaming. His breathing stopped short of hers and his sharing inflict to Aoki's collapsed form. He started to stutter in her direction startled, but then a blur passed by him and went to check on the maid. He had assumed she was deceased. Words cannot express the immense relief that one gulp of breath brought him. Before he heard the incriminating words, a small smile had started to appear on his face. After glancing at Aiko, the blue-haired woman said, she's not likely to survive such wounds. We are barely 20 minutes from the Gojo clan, correct? She asked the driver, turning to face him. The driver nodded and had a deeper frown on his face because he knew where she was going with her questions. I'm only barely good enough to stem her wounds with my reverse curse technique. We take her there, and Takumi-san should be able to. He cut off the blue-haired woman as she started to remark, the clan leader won't be bothered to break his isolation, just to tend to a maid, not even off the bloodline. Nobody but her would be lost to him. That one person he had finally come to care about, he would not let go of. He will, he said confidently. His quiet voice interrupted the exchange. He went on, seeing as both of them stared at him. This time, Sheringen's voice snapped, his body exploding in a wild spin. He was unable to identify the source anger, sadness, happiness, fear, he was not sure. Alone alone, he had experienced more emotions than he had in the previous two years. He spoke, I will make him, with the assurance of someone who knew the sun would rise every day. For some reason, he could tell the blue-haired woman's smile was more sincere. The driver was about to make a decision when the sound of sirens pierced the silence. He was thrown off balance and forced to move quickly to their car, which appeared astonishingly undamaged despite the devastation all around them. With a fleeting glimpse at the ashes that remained of the curse, he was placed in the back seat, and the woman with the blue hair trailed behind him. It was a blur driving back to the property. The driver changed lanes and sped beyond speed restrictions, which he knew would have repercussions, riding like a man possessed. But even with Aiko's head resting on his lap and getting colder by the moment, he couldn't force himself to care. A kick that blew off the car door marked their arrival at the clan gates. With Aiko and the driver trailing after, the woman with blue hair led him out and up the stairs into the compound. The driver attempted to carry him again, but he declined and staggered next to him. Clan members in formal attire passed past and gazed with differing expressions of shock and melancholy. It can't be a brand new scene. Upon entering the clan compound, people were battered and injured by the monsters they had gone to hunt and destroy. Heading towards the manor in the center of the clan, a couple intervened to assist, only to see a white-haired youth waiting at the door. His eyes glowed a startling blue, and he reflexively directed the last of his tainted vitality onto his own eyes. 
It was unexpected that he received a flinch in return, and even more unexpected was the bright smile that emerged. Before the teenager could say anything further, the door abruptly opened behind him. With a grudging scowl and a dramatic pout, he closed his mouth and moved away. Even though they had never spoken, he was aware of who he was. Satoru Gojo, all-around prodigy, sole heir to the clan Dejutsu and heir apparent to the clan. He moved by him and entered the building as quickly as his injured body would allow. The formality and fascination that accompanied his initial visit were absent this time. He fell face down on the futon in front of the elderly guy as soon as he staggered into the room. A face that could have been carved out of granite clashed with neutral eyes placed in a face that was blazing and spinning like a tired person. Heal her, he extended his hand. He spoke in an authoritative, assured, sure tone, appealing. The monotonous voice said, You're hurt for someone who went to peer at the outside world, while his red spinning eyes remained fixed on them. He grunted, something so unlike him and so against his nature that he almost fell back. I'm not the one bleeding out and dying right this moment, old man, he said. He was met with a blank expression from the elderly man. A raised eyebrow broke the callous exterior this time. So are you, he said, breaking the awkward silence. Yet you somehow managed to use your cursed energy to brace yourself in an act of curse energy manipulation I would never have expected from a child of six, and I don't need the six eyes to see that. It's impossible to lose her, he said. I should not be worrying about something unimportant when I could be concentrating on you. This time, he managed to control his emotions despite appearing to be a child. He was not prone to emotional outbursts even in his previous life as a child, so something else must be fraying his nerves and making him lash out. The calmness in his words and his lack of hurrying almost made him angry again. He stopped the flow of cursed energy to his eyes and almost completely stopped using it, staring at the clan head in silence as he struggled to find the right words to say. Why would a sorcerer at the top of the world bother with a common lady for whom he had no feelings? The elderly guy was unaware of her lively demeanor and her beautiful smiles. He was also unaware of her attentiveness to him, as she checked on him twice a night and always slipped in treats during his lunches after realizing he had a sweet tooth. An emotional appeal will not succeed here. The clan chief was not inherently evil or callous. Rather, he was callous toward the commonplace. Considering the number of dead and dying individuals he had witnessed, why should he give a damn about one more? How much was one more commonplace maid's death compared to the hundreds of people who perished every day? His nails dug deep grooves in his thighs as he looked at the clan head, his resolve solidifying in the knowledge that, despite his best efforts to convince himself otherwise, he knew exactly what would happen in the end. He was acquainted with the kind of experience that gave rise to that particular thought process, but he could not accept it here. Not when he had finally found a reason to be happy. The old man saw the resolve in his steel-gray eyes and smiled sharply, even though they both knew there could only be one response to the question, do you want to be a sorcerer? He was ready to sell his life once more ready to lay everything on the line on the altar of sacrifice just to see a loved one spared from a terrible fate. The child has the makings of a monster. Gazing down from 500 feet high at his young cousin's battle, he smiled broadly. A battle machine that verges on being unforgiving. The instructor took a kidney shot that hit him like a cannon. The man with black hair lost his composure after receiving a kick to the side of his knee. He saw as the tiny figure whirled around on his feet and struck his teacher with a tiny fist that was powerful enough to propel the guy backward. The middle-aged man, dressed in a traditional kimono, flipped and came to rest on his feet. He then saw a kick coming toward his face when he looked up. In time to stop it, he raised a guard, but the small monster swung around and used the arm he had been using to block to launch another kick that slipped past the instructor's guard and headed straight for his head. In order to avoid breaking his skull, the instructor ducked his head and raised one shoulder up in time. With just one grip on his leg, the instructor swung around on his feet and gave the child a hard enough floor slam that it cracked the solid slab of stone they were fighting on. 
The child instantly rolled to the right to avoid the follow-up foot slam, which would have shattered what was left of the arena floor. Little things like that were what caught him off guard. This caused the clan chief to duck into the building's shadows and watch a seven-year-old fight. This caused the other powerful clans dare to send spies into the clan complex solely to protect the youngster, and it also forced the elderly monsters of the Gojo clan to keep an eye on the fighting. The clan had been fixated with the altered set of six eyes during the previous 12 months. Its perception was not as sophisticated as the six eyes, but it had shown itself to be more adaptable. An example of this would be his seeming capacity for prediction at strange times. Before the haymaker could even hit his head, Jicky flipped to his feet, dodging it, and then, in one smooth motion, he spun to the back of the instructor. He buried his elbow just below the rib cage, breaking his already sore ribs, then slammed his foot into the back of the instructor, using the force of the blow to flip even farther back. The child also had what Satoru had come to refer to as a killer's instinct, given his extreme speed. Other clan children were still being taught how to physically strike an opponent at this age, where others unconsciously flinched or hesitated. The child never did. He went straight to fighting instead of doing the hand-to-hand -hand training portion. He hit hard and quickly thanks to his quickness and eye's ability to predict the future. Which was lucky because no amount of wretched energy reinforcing technique could make a glass cup as strong as a diamond. He took the few blows that got past his defense in a stoic manner, making sure to return fire. He lowered himself into a crouch, his body trembling from the strain of the battle and the three black tamo in his crimson eyes spinning slowly. The child must have appeared as calm as the waters themselves to the fifteen visible clan members observing the battle. But the truth was revealed by the six eyes. The child was no longer able to go on, but the clan chief did not order an end to it. Even if his hands were clasped together behind his back so firmly that they could shatter granite. His expression was one of coldness. He was still baffled by the clan chief's feelings for the child. Most folks were unable to tell. The way he'd seemed to disregard the child before opening his eyes was enough to conceal it. Most people must have found it heartless that he forced him into such demanding training, even as a young child, combined with the decision he made to keep his mate alive. Satoru, though, was wiser. Satoru had superior vision. He recognized the maid standing to the side scarred, was at least acquainted enough with her during the previous half-year to state as much. Her trembling became more noticeable, as did the dread and fear in her eyes. She made half-aborted gestures to Jiki every time he was struck, but her helplessness was perhaps greater. To alter anything. To take any action. Jiki was the sole reason she was permitted to enter the clan compound this far. She was helpless by herself. He pondered the idea of power as he stood above them all. A man with adequate strength to put an end to it stood on one side, but he was unable to shack him out of duty. There was a woman on the other side who could not really change or do anything. Without the freedom to live your own life, what would life be like? Furthermore, if power could not be used whatever one pleased, what good was it? Satoru desired freedom, independent of his clan. Free from the intrusive bosses, able to actually accomplish anything he pleased, he wanted to be the strongest for this reason among others, but if he was unable to even accomplish his goals, what good was the designation of strongest? He reached a decision at this very time that would turn him into a long-term threat to the Jujutsu Society's elite. He was going to abuse his title of strongest if he was to hold it. If the old man was going to do nothing then, using the clasp of his hand, he uses his cursed energy to close the gap between himself and the child by using his cursed method, which is blue. He silently appears next to the child, but the brat lashes out at him, giving him a careless kick. Not at all like his pinpoint assaults from just moments prior. His application of power causes his foot to stop an inch from his spleen, and he grabs the child by the scruff of his shirt, holding him up. This has gone on long enough. He teleports again, this time next to the maid, and says, I'm taking my cousin on a vacation, see you guys later with a big smile on his face. 
He chuckles at the startled expressions on the faces of the clan members observing the battle, the scowl on the faces of the ancient monsters lurking in the shadows and the subtle smile on the clan chief's face, prior to his teleporting again. Viewpoint of Tatsumi He slowly emerged from the darkness, ignoring the astonished bows and greets he received from the clan members. With a swift gesture, he directed his fellow concealed observers ahead of him. They were still upset by Satoru's arrival, but he had anticipated, even welcomed it. After all, if he couldn't sense the cursed energy of his own grandchild from a meager 500 feet above, he would have been senile. The eye that the clan has come to refer to as the Sharingan first appeared six months ago. A copy of the Six Eyes with Mutations, it had been six months since the other clans had inquired about the boy's background. He thought about the eye as he strolled along the paved path to his manor. Three dark tomo surrounded by red. There had been rumors of another form, the one that created the black flames that instantly destroyed a semi-grade one cursed spirit. However, the youngster had declined to show them again, claiming that using the method too often had rendered him blind. They had come to the conclusion that he was blind, albeit they were not sure how he found out. Similar to how most people employed methods that were cursed. His thoughts came to a stop as soon as he entered his home. Through a side door, he descended a seldom used secret staircase and entered a chamber located down below the clan grounds. The room was dimly lit, the shadows seemed to shift as you looked deeper. Made from the bedrock that encircled them, the seven seats were arranged in a circle. He lived the seventh one in the middle, since the other six were already taken. With a lethargic gait, he asserted it, sitting with his face buried in his palm in a relaxed stance. The moment he lightly tapped his armrest with his second palm, it was signal time. An older person wearing a yellow yukata commented, he's progressing fast. Faster than Satoru and even better mannered, a second speaker said. The room fell silent after the statement. He anticipated its appearance. For all Satoru's apparent strength and natural aptitude, the elderly who obstinately adhered to the outdated customs found him to be a difficult person to like. More so after he began to experiment with the regulations, like a puppy trying to find out how far they would let him, he tugged at his leash. Unfortunately for them, the leash was far longer than they had preferred. With those eyes, the teenager was sure to become the next head of the clan. For the most conservative members of the clan, a peaceful substitute must have been a blessing. Trying to get the meeting moving along, another person said, the Zenin clan sent another envoy to talk about hunting territories, he disappeared during the recess and was caught creeping towards Jiki's house by Satoru. The conversation broke off again and he sighed silently, wondering how long this meeting would last. In his bedroom, there was an unopened painting that was waiting for him. Satoru perspective. So what do you do for fun, brat? The child gave him a quick look, then answered, gazing back at a couple shooting photos next to a billboard. The child softly spoke the word painting. They were so unlike from one another that it was absurd. Despite sharing many physical characteristics, their demeanor and mindset couldn't be more dissimilar. He took off his spectacles and placed the back of his palm on his forehead as he laughed and looked up at the sky. Was this his public image? By now his broad smile was showing signs of strain. They were in a park in the heart of Tokyo. He had a coke in his other hand and Jiki was sipping from his tea with both hands the way they were supposed to, all while the scarred maid stood behind him grinningly watching them interact. More than half a year had passed since the initial exploration that was supposed to happen for him. It was curse-free this time. They ended up here as the day grew progressively darker, having avoided and disregarded the sight of the maid's near-death experience. The child seemed more interested in the automobiles that passed, the technology, and the outfits that people wore. He had been asking questions as they had been at it for hours, queries for which there was a single word response. Do you see 360? He was stunned and silent for a while. Not due to the question per se. It was, after all, a simple one that had already been recorded. The child had shown no initiative whatsoever until now. His unsettling blue eyes were met with pale gray ones. 
Those eyes looked into his, and there was no fear, no disdain, no inferiority. At that moment, he almost reminded him of Guido. When he looked him in the eye, even the clan chief displayed a certain amount of avarice. However, none came from Jiki. With a renewed interest in the discourse, he sat back up and said, Are we talking about our eyes now? A shrug was given in response, which made the child start glancing at people once again. He was going to be lost to him. Finally, he sighed heavily and said, Yeah, sure, when my eyes are active. Do you have a blind spot at the back of your neck? Your thoracic vertebrae to be exact? He had never received a question like this before, so he really opened his eyes to make sure. With a simple head shake, the child assumed a clear thinking position. What do you live for, Sataru-san? His well-groomed brow sprang up in astonishment at the sudden shift in subject. Black and red eyes looked into eerie blue. I've heard of your goal to be the most powerful sorcerer in the world. With those eyes, it's more possible than not. But power for the sake of power. He had to reevaluate the child after giving him another glance. For his age, he had always seemed older. He was not, however, the first genius that the Gojo clan had generated. He had once been like Satoru, brilliant, distant, silent and reserved, but never in such a philosophical sense. He gave the child a gentle scowl and pondered how their lives may have turned out had they been born together. By now, they had the chance to alter history. He motioned for everyone to look around you as they moved through the crowd. How do you think the majority of the Jujutsu community views them? The children said frowning. Anyhow, he had not anticipated a response. The question was posed rhetorically. Subhuman he spat out, disgusted and irritated. Simply because of lack of power. A lack of ability with a gentle shake of his head, he continued they forget that compared to people like me. Like you, they are the same. Yet that is not my biggest grudge with a society. It's the corruption. The very foundation of the Jujutsu society is flawed. You asked why I wanted to be the strongest. It is to have the power to make change and effect it. Single-handedly if I have to. He took a deep breath after concluding his tirade. This was hardly a talk he had anticipated having, much less with a child. He turned to face Jiki again and saw that his eyes had gone back to their dull gray along with a small smile. I've seen the consequences of unchecked power Sataru-san, yet considering your motivations I don't think you'll go down that road. Even if it came from a gremlin that was only four feet tall, those words brought him more comfort than he had to admit. When he received an absurd gift, he was six and a half. His light gray eyes moved from the black eye wrap he was holding to Sataru-san's smiling face. You're aware of the fact that I can't see past this, yes. The smile on his relative with white hair just got crazier, prior to directing his thumb towards his own eye cover. Common brat, try it on. We might discover a new part of your dejutsu. He sighed heavily and did his best to ignore Eiko's low laugh from behind him. If only he had the Byakugan from birth. Then perhaps, just perhaps, he could have granted his irrational cousin what he wanted. Thinking back to the ancient literature he had perused from even earlier Uchiha outposts when he was a lost nin. The cryptic manuscripts provided hazy accounts of a forebear of both eyes, granting a common lineage to the Hyuga and Uchiha. Common kid, try it on. He let out another sigh and slid it lightly around his eyes before channeling a tiny bit of chakra into his nose and ears. He was only one meter away from a dead end in his attempts to create crude, cursed energy pulses using a twisted version of chakra sensors. For the time being, he was unable to figure out how to solve this specific issue. He knew his cousin's smiles must have grown even without his sight and chakra pulse. What he accomplished for his household. Guido's Pav. Spirits cursed were similar to maggots, slick and perpetually in the periphery of your view until it became difficult for them to ignore them, the common people did just that. He strolled along an alley that smelled strongly of blood that had been spilled too much. He felt comfortable in the bizarre picture produced by the splashes on the walls of the too slim lane. The sound of fangs tearing through soft flesh in the dark sounded like a mill buzzsaw, except that it was associated with curses. As mundanes passed the lane, they were unaware of it. 
Their skepticism a defense, their ignorance and incompetence served as a shield. He was sadly lost in his thoughts and his footsteps were louder than he wanted. A mistake he was unwilling to make again. With a move that would have killed any living creature, the multilimbed behemoth wrenched its neck back and let forth a screech that would have scared off lesser men. As it leaped from the corpse it was feasting on, he looked at it boredly. Hopping between the walls, he won't be able to conjure his favorite curses in the narrow alley. However, he didn't think he would need them against this kid. He sighed in disgust at himself. A task that ought to have been simple was about to become difficult. The cursed ghost leapt even higher and vanished above the alley, so it must have felt something. But he knew it was still there. Simply wait. Since he was ten years old, he had been hunting afflicted spirits. Jujutsu sorcerers were the only thing that possessed higher allure for cursed spirits than unique grace-cursed objects. It was as though they were driven by a ravenous need to feed off the curse and grow into something more than their kind. A fierce, unquenchable thirst that was only exceeded by their animosity. The majority of jujutsu practitioners possessed a basic ability to detect evil energy. It was generally ambiguous and could not be relied upon to be correct. Particularly in areas where there had been a great deal of death or bloodshed. It made it difficult to identify the cursed energy of others. In the center of the alley, he waited as a result. Years of tracking down cursed ghosts have trained patience. His muscles clenched beneath his oversized blue jujutsu high school outfit, stilling his outward actions. His nerves snapped at the sound of a shift from above and the faint sound of claws on masonry behind him. He twirled on his feet, extending an arm, and uttered a chant he had detested ever since he discovered his cursed method. Get rid of, take in. The demons lunged forward and disassembled in front of him. With its hands extended, the creature with a featureless face and fanged maw screamed at him. A little orb-shaped bubble of energy filled with a blue curse collapsed and fell into his palm. He regarded the sphere with revulsion. The distilled soul of a damned creature. A foul blue that seems to spread to everything in its vicinity. Ignoring the flavor that was like a nasty rag used to clean up vomit and shit, he forced it into his mouth. It glided pleasantly down his gullet, scraping past his tongue. With a terrible upsurge in the impulse to throw up, he gripped onto the wall. However, it wasn't the first. It wasn't even close to the worst. Straightening his posture, he wiped the corner of his lips. Even though he detested his method of manipulating curses, it was what allowed him to stand side by side with Satoru. The power he exerted. His focus was diverted from the mutilated corpse a short distance behind him by a phone call. Before he turned the phone to his ear, he slipped his hand into his pocket. Gido here. Ah Gido-san, you've been assigned to a scouting job. Two sorcerers have been missing for the past two days, Yudaheim san and Mei-san. At that, he arched an eyebrow. Second grade was Yudaheim's grade, and not one of his book's strongest ones exactly. Mei, though, was no wimp. A first-class sorcerer with the skills and background to support it. The man who was on the phone went on. Your team is on its way. We will meet at the old manor in the forest in the Hamamatsu district. Larry-san will be with me. However, Satoru-san has promised to be there, so I've called him. With a grunt of approval towards the excessively formal handler, he closed the call and walked languidly towards the bus station, hands stuffed in his pockets. Hamamatsu was just a stop away, and the notion of perhaps arriving before Satoru this time made him smile. After half an hour, he found himself ascending a cracked cobblestone trail that led far into the forest. His blighters had warned him that there were only two people there and that the enormous manor emitted so much blight that he could feel it from a distance. After going through the broken gate and arriving at the entrance of the mansion, he was met by the glasses-wearing, business-dressed handler who gave him a quick bow and a sluggish wave from Shoko, who was glued to her phone. He looked around for Satoru and then inquired, returning his own slow wave. He asked Shoko, he's not here yet, is he? But the handler answered. Ah, Gojo-sen informed me he would be a little late as he was already preoccupied before I called. 
A furrow on his forehead met with the usual gentle sound of displaced air, cutting short what he was about to say. Shoko and the handler were unaware of what had transpired. The number of steps that led up the stairs baffled him, but he understood. He knew enough about Satoru's mode of transportation to know that he had arrived. His astonishment increased upon witnessing two Satoru ascend the stairs. He briefly wondered whether he had swallowed the wrong cursed spirit until realizing that the second person was far smaller than Satoru. The young man with white hair was wearing a black long-sleeved sweatshirt, a brown Guido sandal, and a black wrap covering his eyes. His hair was wrapped up in a similar bun to his own, with a few strands dropping to the side of his face. With a broad smile, Satoru watched as they all looked at the two in shock and bewilderment. Shoko responded with grace, what the fuck, her weary gaze finally lifting from her phone to look at the white-haired couple. When did the bastard multiply? She asked. With a hand on the child's head, Satoru could only grin even more and said, this is the new and improved Satoru Tuo. Everyone should say hi. With a groan, the child shook Gojo's hand off and moved fluidly into an appropriate bow. My name is Gojo Jiki, nice to meet you. He had heard of the kid too. The Gojos tended to breed them like rabbits for the title of once-in-a-lifetime genius, and his alleged mutated six eyes were meant to be the frosting on the cake. At the mention of his name, he could see the tumblers click in Shoko and the handler's brain. Shoko smiled and said, I'm Shoko Larry, nice to meet you, offering a handshake that the child accepted with a gentle smile of his own. Shoko pocketed her phone and approached the child. Not to break up the moment, but we've two sorcerers missing and presumably dead in that scary manner over there. He ignored the whispered garbage that accompanied Shoko's scowl and concentrated on the child who turned to face him. He'd heard the child's eyes were not like the six eyes, so how in the world did he move so fluidly with his eyes blindfolded? Let me give you a peek behind a real technique Jiki, Satoru said, stepping forward and stretching. Mao Mao, leave it to you to spoil all my fun, he said, turning his head to look behind him before returning his attention to the building. From the glow in his eyes, he could tell what he was about to do it was less of a technique and more of a subtle application of Satoru's limitless, forming a blue sphere above the building with a hand gesture, and a second later, he could feel the structure tremble and sway as old, weathered planks, windows and bricks were shattered and sucked up by an unexpected gravitational force. The building came down quickly, and with its barrier destroyed, the cursed spirit would have to confront them head on. He stepped back, getting ready to open a portal, and the shattered structure hovered in midair for a split second before plummeting, accompanied by a scream from Yudaheim. Moving to arrest her fall would leave him powerless when the curse finally made its move, since neither Shoko nor the handler would be able to reach her in time. He took into consideration the drop and the angle of her fall and judged it an acceptable outcome. He failed to account for the small white-haired Miss Slee that sped by him, nearly causing him to reflexively call forth a powerful curse. Jiki Opinion He had not anticipated accomplishing much today, as it was one of his rare days off when he finger-painted with Aiko serving as his inspiration and helper. However, together they had gone from getting ready for paint to licking ice cream on the streets of Tokyo where he had spent the last few hours requainting himself with his sense of sightlessness to teleporting to a hunted house. When the call came through, he had asked to come along, thinking it would be the ideal opportunity to witness real jujutsu magic in action. Talking about his teammates, Shoko and Guido, Satoru was only too pleased to oblige. While Shoko's method was significant, it did not pique his curiosity as much as Guido's manipulation of curses. Shoko's technique brought back memories of a teammate from his Anbu days. Their introduction was brief and to the point, particularly when the voice of the person he assumed to be Guido emphasized that they were coming to rescue lives. After that, Satoru destroyed the house, and that's when he heard the cry that caught his attention. He moved, instinctively. His muscles, strengthened by cursed energy, propelled him past Guido and the still-stunned Shoko. His rapid motion caused his eye wrap to come loose, and he used his sharing in without giving it a second thought. His sharing in did the heavy lifting of calculating the angles of the falling building, 
so he leaped off his perch, twisting in mid-air in a feat to match any trained acrobat, skipping off bricks barely bigger than a palm, and landing in a crouch on a falling part of the wall that held pictures of an elderly couple holding each other. The cobblestone cracked under his leap, sending him soaring into the air. His strengthened feet crashed hard into the ground as he tucked his knee and braced as stone, timber frames, and a massive slab of the wall dropped around him, his location on the ground the only exception. The fall was easier, and he headed for the spot where he calculated the least amount of debris to fall. The ground shook beneath him before he could have fully registered the woman's developing red blush and surprise on her face with his one exposed eye. He felt his eye react to the new threat as a mud-colored hand emerged from the ground, pulling up its entire body from beneath the earth. The accompanying howl from the lipless maw of the curse sent his hair blasting back. The three Tamo shifted and reformated into his manjiko. Before an even larger horror tore the earth apart from beneath the monster, a curse like a white and green maggot that bit it in half a reflexive Amaterasu was partly born. He nearly destroyed the two demons with fire, but a touch on his shoulder stopped him. I'm not sure Gito would like you burning his pet all that much. The youngster wearing the earring glanced at him with a raised brow and his body reflexively set in a posture, taking Satoru's warning for what it was and realizing that this was manipulation of a curse. He had noticed that people were affected that way by his main Jaco spinning. Kid, I never thought I'd be seeing you again so soon. The recognizable voice directed his gaze to a certain pile of debris where a well-known, stunning woman with blue hair sat, wearing an umbrella over her head and a gentle grin on her face. Mei-san. After the events of the previous day and in response to Mei Mei's persistent offer to pay her a visit, Jiki returned to Jujutsu High with his friends and cousin. Which brought him to this point. Opening doors he'd feared locked since his arrival, he was finally able to exert more control over the powerful cursed energy that seemed to rage just beneath his skin thanks to his sharing in and awareness. Despite his extraordinary skill in the shinobi techniques, it was with the application of genjutsu that he truly excelled. Imposing your reality of the world both cunningly and brutally on other people. That was proved by his manjiko when his tsukayomi formed. However, in this new environment, he had to battle tooth and nail for every inch of improvement, when in his previous existence, Genjutsu took as much work as breathing for him. It all came down to one thing with his issue. Cursed energy. His gaze drew down to the court from heated conversations. While Shoko braided his hair behind him, he watched the white-haired and black-haired pair discuss their points about the strong and the weak and their place in society on the basketball court. He recognized Guido's concern for the vulnerable. He had, after all, massacred his clan in order to keep the secret leaf safe. Before it was perverted into ninjutsu, Ninshu was meant to safeguard and comprehend one another. But he also recognized Satoru's perspective. Why should the duty of defending the weak be imposed onto the strong? Why put oneself in such clear handicap and shackle? He shrugged indifferently at the growing dispute, returning to his reflections and experiment. Applying Jinjutsu involved sending chakra through one of the five senses, then using the chakra routes that sent chakra throughout the body to take control of the sensory nerve system. Because of their gifted vision, the Uchiha concentrated on visual Jinjutsu. Not like his clansmen though, Itachi saw Jinjutsu from a wider perspective. Even though he was skilled at using all five senses to draw out a subject, he was not objective. The Sharingan eased a challenging task. Using the Sharingan, sending chakra via the opponent's eyes was as simple as breathing and as stealthy as a fish swimming through water. Shinobi in the elemental nations recognized that merely locking eyes with a Uchiha was sufficient justification to attempt to clear their chakra systems. For the most part, the very skilled ones managed to do it quickly. They were never given the opportunity to try. In this novel planet, even more difficult to practice, Genjutsu was not widely recognized as an art. This was just a result of the cursed energy's inherent characteristics. Cursed energy was volatile and random, whereas chakra flowed in reliable paths that made ninjutsu and genjutsu easier to administer and manipulate. 
It was an unpredictable energy source that originated from unpleasant emotions. Any cursed energy transferred into another was quickly disrupted by the opponent's cursed energy due to the instability of the cursed energy acting as a continual flush. Still, he was moving forward. His moment of reflection was cut short when the gym door opened, revealing the main characteristics of Jujutsu Hai. The youngsters were made to cringe before he said a word by his scowl. How long are you going to keep fooling around you brats, and where is Shoko? Shoko responded with an indifferent haya and a wave. The man with a broad shoulders raised his brown eyes to the stands, and when they met his spinning black and red, the stands spread in surprise. Jiki Kun, I didn't know you were here, he said, pointing accusingly at Satoru before turning his focus back to his misbehaving pupil. You're aware that this a high school, are you not, Satoru? Satoru looked away and scratched it, a look of embarrassment on his face. Be that as it may, the higher-ups have assigned the two of you on a mission. A direct request from Tenjin-sama, the principal said, sighing heavily. Yet I don't think anything stops Shoko from joining you, he said in a lighter tone. I'm sure they can handle it, she stood up and waved. Someone has to be responsible for the kid while Satoru is away. Come with me then, Satoru Gido. We've got more to talk about, he said, turning around with a heavy shrug. With a quick wave, Satoru and Gido quickly put on their blue shirt jackets and followed him out. Come on then Jiki, let me introduce you to Nanami-san. With one fluid motion, he rose to his feet and trailed behind her. He knew how one would approach using Genjutsu. The only thing left to do was put it into practice. Regarding Gido and Satoru, he had no need to worry about whatever covert mission the higher-ups had in store for them, they were formidable. According to your instructors, you've been progressing fast. In his dimly lit grotto, the old man reclined with his legs folded in a meditation stance, his eyes closed. He acknowledged with a single nod, and the elderly guy went on. Opening his eyes to gaze at Jiki with a calm and indifferent expression, he said, and yet we still don't know what your innate technique is. For all your immense talent, blessed eyes and potential, you're not competitive until you've acquired your innate technique. He pondered his current issue as he sat quietly. His natural method. He was still viewed as inadequate even though he ought to have unlocked it by now. Only the elders would admit it, and very few would say it to his face. However, it gave clan members cause for discord as they didn't appreciate the seeming preference extended to him. He knew that clan politics were being played. He knew who the two sides were, but he didn't want to play that game with them. What had he gained from playing it once, but sorrow, loss, and regret? I feel like I'm getting close to it, clan head, he said softly. It shouldn't be a problem for long, I promise not to let you down. With the obligatory scolding done with, he said, getting up and moving to the edge of the room where a pot of tea and its attendant cups rested. I know you won't, child, he said. The old man asked him, softly grinning, tell me, how goes your painting of the sunset from the top of Mount Takao? As he strolled back to him carrying a tray of tea and biscuits. He moved from his more formal Caesar position to a cross-leg position that day, letting out his own smile for the first time, and began talking to the old man while taking a cup of tea about one of the few things that truly piqued his interest in this new world. I found the perfect color of blue for. He called Eiko and asked to visit Jujutsu Hai the instant Shoko, informed him that Satoru and Gido were coming back and asked for his help in organizing a surprise welcome back celebration. He had been homeschooled in order to be accepted into Jujutsu Hai, therefore he didn't have much to do today. Despite his lack of interest in studying advanced science, he had no trouble picking it up thanks to his intellect. He had demonstrated to his teachers that he had no need to stay under their guidance, so considerably freeing up his schedule. Even rumors about him enrolling early at Jujutsu High had been whispered to him, but that was all they were. At the base of the lengthy stairs leading to Jujutsu High, their driving came to a halt. Opening his door, Eiko got out of the passenger seat. After getting out, he gave the driver a final nod before turning around and beginning to climb walking hand in hand to Eiko's private gratification. When they eventually passed through the red gates of Jujutsu High, 
He cursed his immature legs and had drips of sweat on his face by the time they reached the top of the stairs. As he passed the gate, he was met with the slimy sensation of a barrier, one that he doubted he would ever get used to. Tenjin Sama's effort, the threads of cursed energy that strengthened the barrier and led deeper into the earth, was visible to his sight. He was not in a rush to meet the eldest Jujutsu sorcerer, and he had not yet had an official meeting with him. The man was nearly 500 years old. To him, it seemed like only a few more years. Still, he'd had enough. Just enough to understand that he was the cornerstone protecting the secrets of curses and Jujutsu. At the gate, Shoko saw them and finished her messaging before turning on the phone and approaching them. Beside her stood the contrasting expressions of smile and scowl, those of Kento Nanami and Hibare Yu. Shoko began as she approached them, they're almost here. She ushered them into the gym and further into the school with a swift rumple of his hair. The sound and accompanying flare of cursed energy struck as he was on the ladder hanging balloons over the gym door. A massive boom that echoed all the way back to the gym. An insider attack at the school was the first thing that came to mind, not possible. He fell to the ground, feeling another wave of that familiar, cursed energy fluctuating. He might have told the owner without even using his primitive senses, Satoru. He had misjudged the blonde-haired teen and was shocked to find Nanami halfway through the door by the time he landed. While Habara and Shoko were still in shock, he had not allowed the incident to affect him. Rejecting them from his thoughts, he trailed Nanami by just one step. He slipped by him, using the reinforcement of cursed energy. Because of his tiny frame, his pool of cursed energy, his exact manipulation, and his increased mobility, he was able to move faster and leave Nanami's face blurry in his wake. Satoru sustained injuries. He was still battling even though he could feel it in the way his cursed energy retreated and fluctuated, fighting against something his senses were unable to detect. His cursed energy vanished just as he was about to approach Satoru. Not possible. Strongest was Satoru. He leaped over the manor that obscured his vision with a reinforced leap from the last spot where he sensed Satoru's cursed energy. Dissolution. His eyes could only perceive that. There was a body, blood, and debris all over the place. A body was raised on an elevated platform surrounded by rubble where rows of houses had formerly stood. A body with fly heads all around it. Common cursed spirits, hardly a threat to themselves. What made a body beneath them then? His eyes told him the body was still, a massive gash tearing beyond the pectoral muscles, tearing aside layers of muscle, fat, and bone to split the torso in two. The pierced heart was buried in the torso. A body with a massive stab wound near the top of the skull on the weak side. A body that some cursed energy lingered in and which his crude sensor abilities informed him was leaking cursed energy. After attempting to fight the inevitable for so long, he had to concede there was a dead corpse. A lifeless corpse that strikingly resembled him. He was staring at the body when a raspy voice screamed out a name, Satoru. He stood there staring at the dead for longer than he should have, especially since the perpetrator was still at large, but all he could recall was a gasp for air and a botched attempt to grab at his cousin. The vision of white hair drenched in blood was burned into his mind by red eyes. The first astonishment had quickly transformed into terror and terror into fury, fury into anger and anger into icy indifference. He would have had more time to be sad, it was not that time yet. Putting his feelings behind the barriers he was taught to build throughout his tenure in Black Ops. He examined the wounded shape lying on the ground. His attention was diverted from Satoru for what seemed like the first time in days by a thunderous explosion of sound and pressure that shook the very earth. He had to rip his eyes from his body and look in the direction of the interior of the school due to the constant explosions and vibrations. He walked away, leaving the body for Nanami and the next person to deal with, stomping his boots. Guido's position was indicated by his cursed energy. Aware he knew his cousin's murderer was lurking. He had blood to sow. It's too late for him to block the sword's initial blow. All he could do was observe. His gaze followed the swirl of steel as it ripped at breakneck speed through Guido's chest. 
For a brief moment, the blood splatter obscures his assailant's vision, yet he nonetheless swings the blade once more, recognizing the ideal slant at which to chop and dismember him. This time, he's not too late. He charges into the collapsing hallway, stomping with his left leg to divert and drive the falling blade a katana, he notes into the hardwood floor. He turns and smacks his right shin into the shocked man's face with a twist of his hips that is so forceful it cracks the man's skull and pulps his brain, sending him hurtling back out of the collapsing hallway and into the debris that was formerly the tombs of the Sky Corridor. He snatches up Guido in one quick motion and jumps out landing a little distance from the crumbling building. The burly man emerges from a hole in the structure he was buried in, waving off dust and saying, Huh, what is this? The little monster is present too. Looking him up and cracking his neck, he examines the murderer of his cousin with detached icy eyes. He was about six feet tall, with black hair and eyes, a scar at his lip, and a body that cried out for unrestrained might robust enough to withstand a blow without faltering. No residual or cursed energy emission. The way the feet are splayed out gives the impression of laziness. He recalls the speed that nearly split Guido in half, the fortitude that enabled him to get to a conclusion despite taking many falls and a strengthened kick to the head without suffering any injuries. It would not be ideal to fight him close quarters. This is confirmed by glancing back at Guido's bleeding figure, but there was nothing he could do. A quiet one? Or does that have something to do with the dead body of your cousin you passed? Hatred. Sharp teeth made for a smile met serene black set in a face with blazing red eyes. Through them he sent his cursed energy. There weren't many genjutsu as strong as the one in his right eye. And he possessed enough hate to use pure force to drive this. Tsukayomi. His eye cracked open and took on the shape of a manjiko tangible hallucinations at his tongue's tip. When the cursed energy ran out of something to cling to, it spilled back out of the man more quickly than it had entered. Not total control instead of energy cursed? How? He moves on, looks for a weakness to exploit, recognizes that the situation is impossible, and adapts. The man took a step forward and kept going, not realizing how quickly this conflict could have ended. I'm not here for you brat, move aside. You killed him, didn't you? It was only when the man shot him a start that he realized he had spoken anything. His voice had not come through. That tone so very flat. When had he previously experienced such intense fury that he had to control his emotions? The demise of Shusia. Revenge then? The man shrugged, his amazement turning to amusement. Valid as any reason I guess, he said. He had to acknowledge that he had misjudged the scarred man's speed. A forearm blurred his eyesight in the blink of an eye. Luckily, the man had misjudged his eyes too. By observing the flow of chakra or cursed energy, as well as the minute twitches in muscles and body language, the Sheringen was able to predict the movements of an opponent. It was more difficult, but not impossible, to predict the man's moves because he lacked the cursed energy. It required all his strength to dive beneath the extended forearm of the lariat despite his renowned speed and support. He got up and threw a left hook into his opponent's back, but the man had stopped his own momentum with an abhorrently strong display of fortitude and tenacity. He drove his feet so deeply into the earth that they created a crater before twisting his hips and unleashing a powerful kick of his own. The two blows came at the same time. Ironically, the man's kick reversed the direction he had taken just a minute before, sending him flying back where his punch had put him staggering a step back. He notices the bruised rib carelessly, flips in midair, lands, and then unleashes an instinctual kick that surprises the opponent and makes him block. He had approached too quickly. With two cursed energy augmented hits to his left kidney this close, he goes inside his opponent's guard and delivers a knee attack to his groin. With a smile, the man accepts the blow stoically and blocks his knee with his well-muscled thighs. The man sent an elbow at his head, changing into a different manner that fit their proximity better. Before it could strike him like one of Lady Tsunade's punches, he lifted his forearms to block, prepared to take the blow. 
but this time his severely broken and bruised forearms cause him to fall backwards toward the remnants of the corridor, where a sword hilt protruded from a wooden floorboard. It was no coincidence that the first onslaught was so strong. He had learned from the first attack, so he reacted more slowly than he should have, expecting him to take off. This time, he anchored himself by channeling cursed energy into the earth. He looks at his trembling hands, mindlessly, realizing that he would be useless if he stopped another attack like that. He stops his hands from moving. He has locked pain up in that dark corner of his soul, making it an illusion. He'd have time to experience it. Following the fact that he left his opponent gasping on blood, he had learned from his attacks how resilient the man's body was. He reaches out, takes hold of the hilt, draws the sword, and holds it with both hands because he is not using his hands. He considers hundreds of different blade forms before deciding on one. His posture was low, his lead foot bent, and his back foot extended, obstructing his view of the sword with his left shoulder forward. He lets out a deep breath and adopts the position, directing his cursed energy towards the sword. The god with four arms and a crazy dance. Form 9. With a head tilt, his opponent gave him a quick glance before advancing once more and grinning even more broadly. The side of the blade deflects a blurring kick faster than his opponent anticipated. Form 7. He steps forward, the blade humming in his arms, and swings down, intending to cut the opponent's leg at the knee, taking advantage of the moment when his opponent is unbalanced. The blade is sent to the side by a hand leaving the thigh with only a small incision. His opponent had healed. Form 4. He parries a hit that leaves his wrist bruised and sends a crack down the blade. He then spins around the next elbow strike, getting to his opponent's back before slamming the blade into his neck. In yet another repulsive display of power and dexterity, the man twisted his neck quickly enough to seize the blade between his jaws and then sank his fangs into it. Even with strengthening, enamel should not have been able to compete with steel. The steel cracked. He turned to look back and saw that his sword had shrunk. Then, in a tanto style. He doesn't think as much this time. He transforms into a shape he was well acquainted with. Willow Leaf style. Form 1. Against the killer of his cousin. There wasn't time for reflection. Not enough time to organize. His eyes, his senses, and the shattered blade in his palm were his only weapons against his superhuman speed. It was a furious brawl. The movements of his opponent are too erratic for him to employ a martyrasu. His pattern of attack is unrelenting. Even after two prior encounters, his stamina appeared unaffected, and he was only able to react while keeping his eyes on his opponent. A strike slipped past his defenses and lodged in his ribcage, his determination to drive the blade deep into the overextended arm in a last-ditch attempt to sever the forearm was strengthened by the agony of the first two broken bones shattering from the contact. His efforts only caused his opponent to wince as his extraordinary muscles tightened, holding the blade and preventing it from plunging any deeper than an inch. After releasing it, he rolled backward and avoided a kick that would have severed his head. He was faltering now. His body was simply too young for all the immense cursed energy he possessed. Cursed energy was too erratic, unlike Chakra. Stress was not as appropriate for a child who was still maturing. He dove beneath a fist and struck out with a kick to his diaphragm that launched him into the air as he stared into his opponent's eyes and saw the gleaming smile on his homicidal face. Something occurred to him. The man took pleasure in the altercation. The excitement the strain of living a precarious life, the craving for blood, the chance to engage in fight only for fun, and for a split second he recognized a blue-skinned man standing in his place. With one blink of his eye, it resolved back into his opponent's black hair and black eyes. He had been thrown into the massive tree at the heart of the tombs of the Sky Corridor by the kick. In order to maintain his distance, the man had buried his hand in the tree. That was all he needed to slow down his vision sufficiently to think this was the first real break he'd had since he prevented Guido from following Satoru's path. The man stood still for the first time, still as a stone. Amaterasu might put a stop to this right away. 
After thinking about it for exactly two seconds, he threw it away. The man possessed a platform and leverage. He could dodge the black flames before it fully emerged thanks to his response and quickness. All he had to do was pull him in. He had to acknowledge his initial suspicions after catching a glimpse of the man's calm breathing pattern. The man was restraining himself. He'd seen the body of his cousin. Two wounds from different blades. The one that nearly tore him in two, and the one on his skull. Not a single one originated from his abandoned katana. Limitless was pierced by one of the two unknown blades, particularly since he lacked natural cursed energy. The capacity was there, but the method was unclear. However, when examining the man, he failed to spot any weaponry save for the coiled, baby-faced, purple-segmented, cursed spirit that encircled his torso. Enhanced perception and a precognitive sight, those are what your eyes offer, are they not? He glanced at him while he talked yet you're hamstrung by a body too young and too weak to keep up. If you were maybe 10 years older, maybe this would have been a challenge. Giving up his hold on the tree, he landed on one of the large knots of rope that surrounded it and gave him a knowing, smug look while tilting his head. Despite his intense desire for blood, the man proved to be more perceptive than he had anticipated. You are really skilled, more so than jujutsu sorcerers five times your age. He needed to buy time for his own audacious scheme as well as for reinforcements. He never imagined that this would happen. In this new environment, he had foolishly thought he would never really face a problem. He was in error. He had not given his training his all. He had forgotten that you need strength to defend what you want in any world. He knew he would have to make the decision even if he did not want to. All he had to do was take a deep breath and begin channeling his cursed energy into what he wanted. Immense strength, resilience, speed and reflexes at the cost of your cursed energy. How is that? That man examined his question and raised his eyebrow. You're really a child, aren't you? To be unaware of a heavenly restriction. With the way you fought, I could have mistaken you for something else. A few meters behind him, a grunt and some movement caught their attention, drawing their gaze to the limp body of Guido struggling to stand. He watched as the man's curiosity and amusement evaporated into a gentle frown that made his skin tingle. I don't suppose you'll just close your eyes and let me go, would you? All the man had to do to respond was look at him with flat eyes. He followed with another crack of his neck. My name is Toji, he said with a gentle smile and his arms outstretched. Would rather not kill a kid barely older than mine, but you're not giving me much of a choice. An arm or a leg then. With what you've shown so far, I'm sure you'll make do. Remember the name of the man you are intended to exact revenge on, Toji Fushiguro, when you get your revenge on you little monster. A voice with flecks of blood emerged from behind him. A whisper that prevented the loss of an arm for him. A murmur that informed him which side of his body to defend. The cursed spirit. The instant Toji vanished from his view, that was the only reason he turned to his right. It was absurd how fast the man had previously run. However, this was simply unthinkable. His perception failed him, for the first time in both life, not being able to read his cursed energy even before he moved. Toji materialized in front of him in midair, pulling a fur-hilted, one-edged broadsword from the purple curse's mouth and unleashing a twisted Lado blow that went straight for his shoulder. His afflicted vigor began to dangerously decline, right now. A crimson spectral clavicle and scapula appeared above him, slowing the broadsword to a standstill that came only after splitting through three red ribs and stopping a few meters from his real shoulder. He went to his knees as the distributed force of the hit blew away, the crumbling buildings and Guido's struggling figure, converting the space underneath them into a crater. He looked into horrified black eyes and saw his own face reflected back in them, but he could not decide who was more stunned. Even as bare muscles naturally developed around his skeleton body to shield him, he could feel his cursed energy dipping. Knowing that his Susano was running low, he knew he only had enough energy left for one final blow. The ploy had worked. Toji's tremendous speed had left him trapped in midair with no way to stop it. He released his grip on the Dark Flames Amaterasu in a murmur. 
He barely had time to witness the flames erupt on Toji before a sharp pain spike obscured his vision and shot straight up into his brain, sending him slamming into the ground head first. Even yet, before he was drawn into the hollow grip of unconsciousness, he could hear Toji's wail of pain. How was he still alive? He blinked at his clouded vision from the clash of blades and the splash of blood on stone. He could feel his life giving blood slowly and steadily seeping out of his body, feeling his lips becoming numb. He made himself go through his fuzzy memories, trying to recall when he had last remembered. A baby-faced cursed ghost spitting out a sword, black hair, a vicious grin on a scarred lip, and then a shock of white hair. Sadaru? Before he remembered the talk that got him to this point bleeding out and having hallucinations the concept gave him some solace. Why are you here? Why? Ah, you mean that? I killed Gojo Satoru. Was it false? He attempted to push his shattered body upward in an attempt to repel the beast. His physique betrayed him. Was this how he passed away as he could hardly move? Lie down while someone else defended him. The sound of breaking concrete and clashing blades nudged a finger closer to him. Was this how he and Satoru were going to stand at the top? They would be the most powerful jujutsu sorcerers, he had assured him. He would make sure to take the bastard who killed Satoru down with him if he was dead. He moved more than a finger this time. With more tenacity than he could recall ever having, he forced his body up and laid his injured hand flat on the earth. After suffering through unbearable agony as a result of his disobedience, he eventually looked up and witnessed the impossibility. His rescuers stood little over four feet tall. His eyes were blood red, his white hair pulled up in a bun. How jicky. The child sidestepped a punch that sent shockwaves through the shattered hallway, avoided concrete cracking stomps, and returned fire with the cool assurance of a murderer. Something monstrous. He was aware of the gossip. However, he felt a shudder run down his spine when he saw the four-foot-tall child flip over an outstretched fist, swing his sword, sever the monster's forehead, and then leap backward using the same fist as leverage. His vision went blurry again, and when he finally focused his blinks, he discovered that Jiki was facing away from him as he leaned against some shattered debris. He knew he had missed the final few seconds by the way he stood, lightly bent over his shattered ribs. Now that they were conversing, he hardly heard Toji's name. The murderous sorcerer. He wanted to laugh aloud. The murderous sorcerer. Hound of the Zenin clan lost. Who else, naturally, would have accepted such a mercenary deal and taken advantage of them in this way? He had to get up because Jiki was going to die if he did nothing. For sure he was aware of that. Pushing himself off the rubble, he sank to his knees, put his rage, shame, and contempt into the last ember of cursed energy he possessed, and saw it light into a bonfire. The sorcerer killer moved when he looked up, ready to give Jiki his life. A blaze of red and white gave him only enough time to issue a warning before he was thrown backward. He was startled from sweet oblivion by the screams. Once more, he appeared, this time in the arms of Onikin, a four-armed, scaled cursed spirit who was positioned like a turtle. The curse unfurled with a tap of his hand, bringing him to the ground, where he grasped it for support. The scream had ceased by the time he regained his equilibrium, and when he looked up, he saw that the sorcerer killer was staring down at one of his arms as it lay engulfed in black flames. He had one palm on the stump of his forearm, trying to contain the blood that was oozing from the field amputation, and his eyes were wide. His teeth were stained with blood. Even still, Guido was certain that he would perish if the man chose to turn against him. As easy as that. Ignoring him and the grade 2 cursed spirit next to him, the guy gazed at Jiki's fallen body for a brief moment before it vanished in a blur of black. Jiki was still wrapped in the rapidly fading form of a red-colored torso. He let out a deep breath and, with the help of the cursed spirit next to him, hobbled forward, looking only briefly at the fur hilt sword the guy had left behind before bending to speak with Jiki. His body lay cold and his armored torso had totally vanished without a constant supply of cursed energy to power it, but he heard the brief, sharp gasp of someone clinging to life. His blood froze to ice at the sight of his face. 
Jicky had white eyes. Blood trails down his eyes, pure white, with hardly a circle separating the whites from the pupil. He did not stop to think about what that may mean, gently lifting the lad with his summons and sending him staggering out of the tombs of the Star Corridor in bridal carry. Jicky's Perspective When he awoke, it was dark. A strong habit takes precedence over an impulsive reaction. He fanned out his senses after counting to ten to make sure he was awake and not dreaming. His flesh felt the smooth cotton that enveloped his eyes, covered his clothing, and encased him from his toes to his chest in an even thicker layer. He felt a slight strain on his thighs as well. His nose detected the distinct smell of dried blood, industrial strength cleansers, and antiseptics combined with a faint hint of zunda and cream kikafuku. Three distinct heartbeats could be heard by his ears, his own steady rhythm, the erratic heartbeat of the person with his head resting on his legs, and the slow heartbeat of the person traveling farther away and pulling what he thought to be a trolley. His senses indicated him he was probably lying in a hospital bed, and the scent of cream kikifuku and zunder reminded him of Sataru. But Sataru was dead, therefore that was not feasible. An unconscious spasm was brought on by the unforgettably vivid picture of his dead cousin, lying with several stab wounds to his head, chest, and throat. With a forceful sat up, he braced himself for agony a second later. After waiting for the pain to subside for five seconds, he had to acknowledge that, for whatever reason, he was not feeling it. Jicky? A startled voice exclaimed, a voice that he had come to know and love. Not possible. He had passed away. His heart lay motionless inside a fractured chest cavity, as his three Tomo Sheringen had observed. He couldn't and won't be deceived by his sight. Hands in a frenzy reached up and tore the bandage off his eyes. He opened it again, and the fuzzy form in front of him was barely visible. Sightless. He was not seeing. One ailment and two lifetimes. He could feel his stomach turn into a hysteric. Blindness. His nerves gave out. He could feel his hands reaching automatically for his eyes again. Why, why, why? Why did he have to lose things all the time? Why did he have to give something up all the time? What more could be expected of someone who hadn't given it his all? His tiny wrists were held in place by gentle hands to prevent them from harming his eyes. Jicky, I'm here. He could not believe it, but the voice this time did not have the same surprise and instead had a gentle firmness that made his frantic breathing stop. Hi, this is Jicky. Big Brother Sataru is here. I'm fine, and you will be too, he said, pausing to bring his head closer till their foreheads touched. The comfortable motion soothed him, and from this angle he could make out the hazy outline of white hair streaked with blood and bright blue eyes. And for the second time in his two lifetimes, Jicky broke down in sobs, clinging to Sataru as they streamed down his face. The door ahead of them clicked, ending their emotional reunion. Jicky felt his walls rise again, albeit more slowly than normal, but by the time the two footfall halted at the foot of his bed, his expression had calmed down to disinterest. Tears lined his face, the only reminder of what had happened only moments before. Heard you guys talking while we were outside, decided to give you guys the chance to hash things out a bit. It was Shoko's voice, he noted. The next individual Guido, he assumed, gave a gentle ruffle of hair and a quick action that he quickly classified as a nod. Suguru-san, how are you feeling? He inquired kindly, turning to face the guy he last remembered to be half dead. Better than you kid the voice offended him in some manner. Was the tone the problem? The phony undertone of the words, the fake ease, though he was unsure, he was positive that something was off. He was informed that Shoko had given Guido a backslap on his head by a muffled yell and a flash of motion. His face lit up softly at the motion. Perhaps it was him who was giving ideas where none existed. What about the man, Toji Fushiguro? All sounds in the room were silenced by those words. He was able to hear Guido and Sataru's heart palpitations an abrupt increase in rate. He felt Sataru's hand tighten and then loosen for a little moment. He glanced back at Sataru with vacant white eyes, looking for something more than the plain response of he escaped that he received from Sataru. 
Guido was the one to break the silence this time around by speaking up. He severed the hand your technique was holding after you blacked out, and then he just up and left, he said, giving Jiki a forced, inoffensive shrug as she heard garments fluff at shoulder level. Satoru woke up and found you half dead, and he's been by your side since, while we've looked around for him with not much luck. At that time, he was still living. His calm mask nearly cracked a second time. Though Toji was missing a hand, his target was his head. The black embers should have struck Amaterasu in the face first, but he was too close to avoid them. Nevertheless, the monster was able to avoid Amaterasu's instantaneous apparition and yet react quickly enough to chop off the hand before the flames spread. Seeing the three of them in a bad mood, Ieri loudly clapped her hands to lift them all out of it. After saying in other news, we've got good news and bad news for you, Jiki-kun, she crossed the bed, brought out a chair, and sat down next to him. He heard the abrupt joy in her voice and asked, what do you want to hear first? He selected the good news with a head tilt. You can regain your sight. After his back was sent straight by the words, he eased back into the bed, like a doorbell silent. Lady Tsunade was unable to guarantee him that. The eyes of the Manjiko were cursed to deteriorate with increased use. This time, it had transpired faster than he had expected, which he ascribed to his advanced age, cursed energy, and using Suzano and Amaterasu at the same time. The only way to treat the ensuing blindness was to remove one eye and implant the other, robbing the recipient of their sight in the process. How he uttered in a whisper. The happy reply was, reverse curse technique, I got confirmation on scanning your eyes through Satoru briefly going over to the Gojo clan and kindly requesting for you after they took you from Gido. That meant he took it, that Satoru had leveled one or two buildings and made them surrender to him. He comprehended their situation. They thought the Sharingan was a six-eye mutant. Understanding it could lead to understanding the six eyes. It must have been blasphemous to divulge that kind of information to those outside the clan. When he returned to the clan, he would have to attempt to mend fences. The pathways that lead from your brain to your eyes are heavily degraded, most likely due to a sudden and heavy surge of cursed energy. Luckily for you, there are few things the reversed curse technique can't do. Healing your eyes is not one. Especially in the hands of the most talented reverse cursed sorcerer Japan has seen in the past century. She boasted without difficulty. The bad news is that, even with my help, it won't be easy. Your eyes are unique. The pathways are different, with entire sections seemingly made out of cursed energy, she said, giving him a quick shake of his head. But with Satoru's six eyes manipulating cursed energy while I heal, it won't be impossible. Satoru was struggling when Guido came around to pull his other arm, so she grabbed him and hauled him off him. We'll give you the chance to rest. Plus, you've another guest who has not left your side for the past week. Another person entered the room as they were leaving. He could tell who had intervened by the strong taste of salt and water and the rough breathing. He turned to face her sobbing figure, grinning gently, and murmured Aiko. She bolted for him, her hold tightening as she slammed into him. He gave her a passionate hug in return, disregarding her messy appearance because he couldn't see much of it. His own blood stained the sofa when he woke up face down in a puddle of drool. He attempted to get himself up, almost tripping over the task. He looked down at the stump of his arm, shrugging off the cloth that had been draped over him and raising an eyebrow as he remembered the fight with ease. How did he wind up on a child-sized futon? He recalled staggering to an apartment and dropping right at the door. When he looked up, he noticed Megumi, his sleeping son, curled up on a chair and covered in a blanket. Please take care of Megumi. Something in him snapped at that voice, that memory. He thought of the little creature he had fought as he looked at the child. He grinned sharply, losing himself in that memory. As he released himself, the agony of losing his arm appeared to vanish. How much he would have given to carry on the battle. He had seen the white-haired child become more precise in his technique. His body grew weary, but his blows became more fluid. He'd felt as though he was honing a steel blade that had let itself to rust. The sight of blood trickling through a crudely made tourniquet brought him back to the present. 
it took him only a few seconds to tense his muscles and halt the blood supply to his arm. He turned back to Megumi after hearing a soft shuffling sound and an indistinct mutter. From the height, he estimated that they were approximately the same age, maybe different by a year or two. He was soon to turn him over to the Zenin clan. Please take care of Megumi. He shook his head, a hopeless attempt to block out that specific memory, got up and turned to leave the room. Again, he was unsure about that decision. He was sure she would not have approved of his decision, even if he had never really thought about it before because the Gojo clan had turned the child into a monster. Please take care of Megumi. He felt even more confident about that now. He accidentally hurried out of the room after passing a sleeping face that was quite similar to hers. Should someone be the one to turn his son into a monster, wouldn't that be him? He avoided them because of this. It was too much for him to always be reminded of her. Even though it was a sloppy bandage, the child had replaced his previous bandage of a torn shirt when he was at his lowest. This is where his legs had brought him to. He entered the apartment's kitchen, turned on the faucet, and submerged his head to let the water remove the dirt that had accumulated on his face during the course of the previous night. When a side door opened, he swung around in readiness, only to see Tsumiki's shocked expression as she peered down at his one-handed, bruised, and battered shape. Where's your mother, Tsumiki-chan? He asked, smiling as he skillfully moved the kitchen knife behind him. XXX. Akko. In contrast to the opinions of most people who have recently encountered Jiki, being blind didn't bother him at all, other than a fleeting dislike of it at first. His eye wrap had since grown to be a semi-permanent characteristic. Even without access to his eyes, he appeared to be able to discern movement just as well. Her eyes followed him as he moved deftly around a table that he somehow knew was there, picked up a paintbrush that he knew was a deeper shade of red, and splattered it on his painting. One glance at his unwavering gaze, which nevertheless managed to display a kind grin, dispelled any possibility that his ferocious strokes were him channeling his hatred toward his predicament into his artwork. He picked up a blue brush and dropped the red one, then turned back to his painting. With one fluid motion, he picked up the cup of tea she had made in the kitchen, put it next to his brushes, and then put it back on the tray. The two other maids and guards who had been assigned to them after his encounter with the sorcerer killer gazed at the unbelievable spectacle before them, their faces completely bewildered, and she had to bite her tongue not to laugh. She turned back to his painting and stared at the quickly developing portraits of two persons with similar features. She thought the red and black background represented eyes, as the two clashed, one in a blue and white robe and the other in a black and red one. She experienced her laughter dying in her throat. Even so, the image had already begun to evoke in her a sense of loss, suffering and melancholy. She watched him continue his skillful strokes, looking down on his white hair and gentle grin. He would have painted everything in his life. Before she hurried him off to have a bath and wash the paint from his hair, they would have enjoyed tea, cookies and chocolates as she complimented him on his exquisite paintings. Sadly, that was not the life that this was. Her right rib caused her to experience phantom pain, which broke her fantasy. His persona had evolved beyond being the affectionate young man who would give her a peck on the cheek or comfort her by holding her hands at difficult times. The clan tried their hardest to shape him into becoming their blade after witnessing what he was capable of. They were only delayed down by his recent injury, which gave him time to rest and recuperate until his healing was complete. This was all her fault. Maybe if she could have died with grace that day. A hand, somewhat calloused and streaked with paint, slipped into hers, interrupting her thoughts. She shook her head and looked around, taking in the jealous looks from the new maids and the indifferent one from the guard in return, before turning to face him. He had stopped painting to calm her down after noticing her tumultuous emotions as he looked up at her with a gentle grin. He asked in a leading question, Eiko. Before understanding he was still momentarily blind, she shook her head. He smiled abruptly, as though he understood something about what she had done. She nodded submissively and said, I'm okay, Jiki-kun. Sorry for distracting you. 
A guy dressed in the more traditional clan attire ascended the stairs, giving them a quick glance and a respectful gesture to Jiki before continuing. His reply was interrupted as his head snapped to the entrance of the outdoor gazebo they were sitting in. Miss Eerie is here to see you. Jiki nodded quickly, turning to return his instruments to their proper place, only to have her intervene just as he was about to begin cleaning the paint off the brush. Leave it to us, Jiki-san. She gestured to the other two maids after giving him a hard nod. Even though Jiki was younger than her by several years, she had been his servant from his birth, and not many people dared to belittle her because of Jiki's strong preference for her particularly since it was known that the clan chief had called to inquire about her son's advancement. She followed Jiki and the guard as they made their way to the main clan compound. She could feel him getting further away as they left. His motions became more fluid and the walls started to develop again. There, in the conflicts he would fight, she could not support him. However, she could guarantee that he would always have a cozy place to return where he could just be her little Jiki and not have to compete to become the next clan chief contender. She turned to face the two maids and gave them instructions to tidy up his outdoor studio while she gave one final reassuring thought. XXX. Shoko. She let out a deep sigh, forced herself to cease the reconstruction of her cursed energy from negative to positive. With a deep sigh, she released her grip on Jiki's head and extended her back. With his pale hair cascading over his shoulders, Jiki assumed it was a request to sit up, projecting a frail and vulnerable image. She stopped herself just as she was about to pull on his adorable little cheeks. She recalled the destruction the sorcerer killer's battle caused to the tomb's hallway. Jiki was not a helpless child in need of tender care. Quite unlike his relative, he was typically a champion of stoic indifference most of the time. A lock of hair dropped across his face, and he blew the hair away from his cheeks, exposing grey-white eyes. Her little chuckle at the spectacle was followed by her moving behind him to assist him in pulling his hair into the preferred bun, even though she knew it was becoming too much for him to have it tied up that way. She asked, disregarding his endearing scowl improvements, he turned to look at her, then around the room that they had been given. After spending the last two hours in bed, he murmured, some colors and gently got out of bed. He looked at her for a moment and said, the brown of the floorboard, the white glare of the bulbs, and the soft brown of your hair. With a gentle smile, the charmer gave in to the temptation and pulled at his cheeks. She quickly changed her smile to a frown when the man in a kimono who approached them, saying, If you're done then, Iiri sama She was aware of the other four individuals stationed outside, ready to react to any potential threat from her. With Satoru present, they would not have attempted this. They would never have ventured this near, but unfortunately, Suguru had turned renegade after becoming utterly disillusioned and Satoru was preoccupied with tracking down the killer sorcerer. She let out another deep breath and realized that she had been letting out more breaths than usual. With just three more sessions left, Jiki would return to the youngster who caused the other clans to become really concerned about what the Gojos were feeding their kids. She reasoned as she took out a pack of cigarettes and a lighter and began to walk back out. Regretfully, he had shown himself to be as incompetent at using the reversed curse energy technique as his cousin had been, which was undoubtedly not her fault at all. Many thanks, Shoko-san, she said, waving him off before she remembered the present she had given him. This is for you to take. She took a moment to search her pocket before locating the tiny item and throwing it to him. Suguru sent it over. A thank you gift for saving his life back then. The toss began to veer off course, but before he could even look, he reached out and caught the box in midair. She hustled even faster out of the room, ignoring the athletic feet and incredible spatial knowledge that she was sure were beyond her. She wanted to avoid being the one to inform Jiki about Suguru's actions, but she wasn't sure how he would react. What she would give to sit through that drama with a bag of popcorn is to see it with his cousin. He was unable to tell how it started where his life's worth of love and care had started. That was a falsehood, no. Glancing to his side, Eiko's beaming, clapping bright-eyed form refuted that theory. He was aware of the impetus for this shift. 
His previous life had been filled with obligations and demands, and it had ended with him being despised, vilified, and abandoned. Only one individual knew how he had contributed to the war's end. He is accompanied by family as he starts this new life. He witnesses Satoru forcefully hitting Nanami's fair hair with the conical birthday party hat. Companions After a second sidelong glance, he notices Shoko smiling and appearing noticeably less exhausted than normal as she pursues Yudaheim. With a gentle grin and half-closed eyes, Mei sat in the shade, holding a drink in her hand. This was all her fault. It was she who awoke him from his trance, remained at his side the few evenings when that specific deed haunted him. It was her who helped him to fully accept the new life that had been extended to him. He remembered how the day had begun before he found himself in a random Tokyo park, surrounded by friends and family. XXX. He was just getting dressed after showering. She eventually received the hint and left Eiko alone after refusing to help him for the seventh time try. After that, she reappeared to assist him a few of times, explaining his unusual infirmity, but he had disabused her of the idea that his sudden blindness rendered him worthless. He grabbed a towel from its stands as soon as he stepped out of the bathtub and dried his body and hair. Idly noting its increased weight, he forced his hair into its bun. He would have to carry it differently or cut it off shortly. Reaching the clothing he knew were spread out, he quickly felt the two materials and saw that Eiko had arranged them in two distinct looks. One was a kimono in a formal style that matched a matching Hayori and Hakama in an alternative manner. The other included shorts and an oversized shirt that was more laid back. The choice was not tough. When he stepped outside in the baggy shirt and shorts, he noticed that Eiko had probably been waiting for him with a small box and an eye bandage. Even though he had been receiving healing sessions using the reverse curse technique, he continued to cover it up under Shoko's directions. All her hard effort would be for nothing if she overstressed her still sensitive eyes. Shoko-san has set up a new location for your last treatment. He pondered as he slipped on the matching black earrings Guido had given him. Apparently, it was not going to happen in the clan compound. That was expected. Since then, the clan had become extremely protective in an oppressive fashion, with outsiders like Shoko bearing the brunt of it. Where will we be going? He questioned, turning to proceed towards the door of his small structure with an extraordinary sense of awareness of his surroundings. With the driver's steady heartbeat, faint apple aroma, and sharply edged leftover curse energy, his senses registered that someone had unlocked the door. Shiba Park in Minato City, Tokyo. An amusement park? He knew this must have been premeditated, especially if they had also had the clan head's agreement, and they weren't just sneaking out, as he noticed the absence of his other maids and an additional guard. The driver opened the door, got inside, moved further inside, and allowed Eiko to take a seat next to him. He continued to be curious. He went on, is there any special reason why the final treatment is being done in a park? as soon as she was seated and the driver had taken his place. Her neck rotated to face him, and even though he could not see her, he could hear her. She replied, as if that would make a difference, today is June 9th. Okay? He knew she was staring at him with a look of confusion on her face. He knew that the same perplexed expression was reflected back to him. Surprisingly, more than anything that had transpired today, she snapped her head forward and ignored his leading inquiry. Resigning himself to the enigma as it was, he closed his eyes and leaned back his head, letting himself drift into the lovely void of slumber. XXX. Hand in hand, they strolled toward the park. Along with the heavier footsteps that followed them at all times, he could hear youngsters running around and shouting with glee, dads, he figured. He noticed they were getting closer to an area that was more remote as they ventured farther into the park. Dogs barking, kids laughing and anxious parents fumbling with racing hearts were the sounds from the park that slowly faded. To the sound of the wind passing softly whistling and the chirping of birds and rustling leaves. With a stretch of his cursed energy, he saw his driver many meters away and only one passenger in front of him. Beyond his expectations. Hayajiki, ready to finally lose those eye wraps, 
Shoko was the one who shouted as soon as they were close to the person he had sensed. Thus, this was not a well-planned attack or abduction attempt. He released the tension in his shoulders and offered her an appropriate bow. Shoko-san, I'll be forever grateful for your aid. On my cute and formal little jiki kun how the hell did you and that bastard Satoru come from the same family? There was a smirk on his face at the tone shift. Shoko told him to lie down on a section of the grass covered in blankets, and he felt her begin to work as her hand came up to rest on his head. With a little scowl, he noted Satoru's absence objectively once more. For several months now, something had been going on. Anything awful, anything having to do with Guido, but for some reason, they were determined to keep him in the dark. He felt the positive cursed energy of Shoko flood into him with those thoughts in mind. He was constantly surprised by how much it felt like a chakra, especially in contrast to the evil cursed energy. Before it stopped on his eyes and sank in, he could feel it go through passageways. They remained that way for almost 60 minutes, during which time Jiki felt his optic nerves swell and become more connected. Feel the massive patches of nothingness that had been covering his vision most of the time progressively go away. He could tell that Shoko was finished when she let out a deep sigh. Gradually getting up, he attempted to take off the eye covers that had, strangely, remained on this time. However, he was unexpectedly stopped by the power of Aiko's rather roughened arms. He let go of her hand and sensed her reaching for the eye bandage, slowly loosening it. The instantaneous surge of several cursed energy signatures surrounding him triggered his fight-or-flight response. Were they positioned to ambush them from behind a barrier? He turned his gaze from its lifeless gray shape to its three eyes immediately. His eyes almost watered from the unexpected clarity of vision. The sight of the large cake in the center and the beaming smiles on the faces of Satoru, Mei, Nanami, and Yudaheim did. Happy birthday, Jiki! He was certain that he would always remember this picture. His eyes would always be blessed, and the recollection would always be pure. Taking him by the hand, Eiko dragged him into the celebrations. XXX, Jiki Kun, how are the new eyes going? He said as Satoru sat down next to him and put his arm around his shoulder. He recognized that this was their first meeting in more than a month, being thus close to his cousin. The teen's unearthly blue eyes were observed to have heavy circles beneath them and his cheeks had flushed, indicating that he was intoxicated. Ever since his recognition as a sorcerer of exceptional caliber, Satoru has been extremely occupied and the weight of those high expectations appeared to be bearing down on his thin frame, particularly in light of Guido's disappearance. You appear fatigued, what have you been doing? He shot back. With a humorous wave of his arm, Satoru responded, Mao Mao, traveling around and putting the more pesky curses down. Given his knowledge of him, he most likely used red to completely destroy them, while grinning as he watched them struggle to overcome infinite. It was rare for his cousin to go to close quarters as his first choice in battle. I heard about that, how's that been? After responding, boring mostly, Satoru collapsed onto the grass. Jiki looked at the grass and then sat with him to look at the sky. Few real special grade curses to actually prove a challenge, it's been mostly hordes of weaker second or first grade curses, with the rare rogue sorcerer. With a playful tone, he questioned rogue sorcerers. His past as a missing nin was evoked by the name. Despite receiving early instruction from the clan and instructors, many deeper nuances appeared to be absent. One was the Sorcerer Killer's Celestial Limitation. Now, evil wizards. Objectively speaking, he understood it was one of the things he was supposed to learn when he reached Jujutsu High. If he wasn't as trustworthy, he would have assumed the clan was withholding information from him. Mostly self-taught sorcerers, sorcerers that follow the old ways of master and apprentice, or sorcerers that refuse to join the Jujutsu Society. The higher-ups deem them rogue and generally blacklist them from a lot of opportunities frequently offered to sorcerers. He pondered on the circumstance. A gang of sorcerers would only go dark if they were blacklisted as a whole, deliberately forming an underworld society of jujutsu sorcerers. He had to acknowledge that he knew very little to nothing about the outside world, even though he wanted to call it foolish. 
Why are you filling my cute little Jicky's head with such dreary topics on his own birthday? Asked Mei San. Though the blue-haired woman always looked to meander around, he had not even heard her movement. I'm just getting him ready. He's going to be the next big bad special grade sorcerer like his big cousin, Satoru responded, feigning a pout. Special grade. The Jujutsu Society appeared to have a strange and ambiguous ranking structure. A grading system that included cursed items, cursed instruments, and cursed weapons in addition to the individuals they faced. Grades 4 through 1 in order. Next came the special grades. They weren't always the strongest, based on what little he had learned. All of them appeared to have a spark, even though their builds were varied and their skills went beyond the more strict framework of jujutsu grading. A spark that always came before them, a spark that distinguished them from the others, a spark that hinted at greatness. A spark that, so the story goes, he had from birth. He had to admit to not being all that fond of something. In a softer voice, Satoru concluded, you know, it's lonely at the top. He glanced at his cousin, suddenly reconsidering after recalling a specific exchange they'd had some months prior. Though his cousin might not like it, he appeared committed to altering the way Jujutsu society and the clans functioned as a whole. He brought to memory another idealistic relative he had had in a previous life. Finally, he failed a cousin. This time, he made a self-promise to do things differently. This was not going to be his last failure. He had no idea what had spurred him to say the words. When he spoke those words, what caused power to sag and resonate inside them? He stated it even though the world momentarily stopped when he said those words. He made a vow with all the conviction that came from having to endure two lives of hardship and violence. You won't be for long. The globe appeared to hold its breath as soon as he spoke those words. He felt several pairs of eyes snap to them. The summer winds that had been churning up the grass halted and the chirping birds stopped. Suddenly the clouds halted motionless, refusing to continue their otherworldly journey across the heavens. When eerie blue eyes met menacing red, they realized that whatever happened, whether rain or high water, tragedy or disaster, they would never have to confront it alone again. May, maintaining her normally calm exterior, interrupted the moment with a focused stare at him. Never felt the world bend and fold over for a binding vow like that, she said. If it had been anyone else, I would have laughed in their face and awaited their funeral, kid or not. Satoru interrupted asking, but he's not just anyone is he? He turned to face the other person and saw that their eyes were all wide. Satoru carried on, completely unaffected by the absurd glances they were receiving. He was so happy and laughing that the weighty sensation that was bothering him seemed to have vanished. He is my little cousin. He was only really thinking one thing with all the chaos going on around him. What the hell was a binding vow? Looking down at the shattered figure of his most recent opponent, Jiki thought to himself, six years was a long time to mature. Given how quickly he had progressed in both incarnations, his understanding of time and competence relative to age groups had always been severely distorted. He'd always been the kid with too many responsibilities, expected to grow up and mature before his friends. That experience came to an end with this. His long, pale hair stuck to his garments as the sweat trickled down his back slowly. He stood above the broken body of the supposed strongest Gojo of his generation, but he nevertheless spread out his extraordinary spatial awareness to see how they were looking at him. His gaze strayed back to the elder teenager. His white hair and green eyes indicated that his bloodline was as pure as it could be without him becoming Satoru, but other than that, there was nothing remarkable about him. He could understand why his waking was met with such jubilation if this was the quality of sorcerers the Gojo clan was creating these days. With fire-green eyes that suggested a vendetta against him, the older kid had proven to be the most resilient he had faced thus far. Acknowledgement where credit is due. Eiko had started providing him with dossiers on the notable members of the clan, and he remembered that the elder adolescent had been somewhat of a genius before his awakening, but he could not for the life of him care. A feeling of envy. The elder teen's envious tenacity had allowed her to withstand cursed energy, enhance strikes that broke bones and splintered flesh for an extended period. 
The teenager had remained resolute. If nothing else, Jiki could provide him with that. He used to have terrible stamina. Six years ago, he would never have made it past his fourth opponent. If he'd ever made it this far, he would have had trouble delivering a truly calculated hit. He would have had broken bones and bruises when he exited the spar. The only injuries left on his form now were from attempts to penetrate his defense. The elderly voice of the former clan chief Tatsumi shouted out, Any other challenger? Juki threw her red eyes around to see if anyone would accept the challenge. Before he could reach them most turned away, a handful of them answered his calm gaze with enraged ones. They were, he observed, the ones more in line with the traditionalists according to Eiko's observations. His steady success seemed like a thorn in their side. Was it that he had been outspoken in his defense of Satoru, even though it was clear they wanted to use him as a prop against his cousin? He glanced back at them, wondering if they truly thought he would bow to their demands and play the role of a pawn in their conceitful shadow wars. That would have lasted him ten lives. An elder voice said, I will trade instructions with Junior Jiki if he'll have me. The elder man who chose to accept the challenge was met with a stern look as his eyes shifted to the side. Satoru's generation included Gojo Tanaka. He was thought to be one of the most gifted members of the clan to have been born in recent memory, at the age of 24. Not that he needed the six eyes to go along with his remarkable mastery of the inherited boundless technique was inferior to that of just the elders. Tatsumi the old man regarded him, waiting for a yes or no response. Ten years was a decade in the making, thus he was entitled to say yes or no to a duel with the elder. Both he and the onlookers knew coming into this battle that he would be at a disadvantage, especially considering the limitations the clan had placed on his use of Amaterasu. Nonetheless, there's a reason why this specific training area was given the name the Sugawara Blood Furnace. Because this place was named after a renowned ancestor, spars were fierce, rarely declined without causing tremendous shame, and death was never a surprise outcome. Presumably, the heavily worn platform was over a millennium old, and the purpose was to sharpen the younger generation during peacetime. It had only ever happened once to win nine fights at once. Eiko saw that Satoru had laughed as he left his opponent's shattered forms behind him that day. His cousin's status as the clan's finest sorcerer was solidified on that day. Having defeated Satoru in eight of their previous encounters, Jiki knew he would need to fight alongside him to ensure that his promise to him was kept. Only matching his record in this instance was going to be the first step. His crimson eyes lowered to the specific individual who was anticipating his arrival. He had pale blue eyes and a heavy set brow, and his short white hair framed his powerful, sculpted chin. His rough facial features complemented his heavy build, which suggested that he was accustomed to receiving blows and giving them back. Jiki was positive he had been trained to take Satoru's position in the event that his cousin fell, given his traditional Gojo features and his derivative of Satoru's boundless skill. Suddenly tensing his muscles, Jiki held the position for five seconds before letting go and reveling in the fleeting feeling of bliss brought on by the release of tension from his body. He shrugged off the sweat-drenched Yakida and let it pile up at his waist, secured in place by the sparring gi he tied around his waist. He displayed an unfit body for a 14-year-old child, exposing his muscles and assuming the well-known four-winged crow kata posture while simultaneously extending one arm forth to signal his opponent. Come. His rival shot him a pointed grin, then got up fast and strode toward the platform with a swagger and a confidence that verged on conceit. Sensing that this was a setup, Jiki stared him down. The aim was to lower his status within the clan, and he was positive that all of his previous opponents had been chosen to exhaust him, lower his output of cursed energy, and then send in someone he would find difficult to deal with. He had been ready for it, had determined to go through with his forging, and he had carelessly triggered the trap. After all, he had his own scheme, which relied entirely on a method requiring a small amount of cursed energy and a great deal of control. Massive control that, during the previous six years, he had honed and concentrated on. Begin. 
The spar began at a breakneck speed as his opponent charged at him full speed before launching a low kick that was intended to cripple his legs. His eyes saw it coming, for what it was, a ploy. He chose to ignore it and leaned back in order to avoid the actual strike, which was an uppercut aimed at his jaw. The elder man switched from strikes to grabs right away, observing his capacity for anticipation and dodging. Advancing and grasping his arm, Jiki advanced even further, putting his foot on his opponent's front knee to halt the forward momentum, before launching himself at the man's side once more with a kick. A kick delivered by the man using the infinite method that stopped six inches short of his ribcage. A palm attack was thrown towards his chest, which he avoided by circling around and landing two strong strikes into the man's ribcage and thigh, which were both stopped by Limitless, as he wrenched his sweat-stained arm free of his opponent's grasp. Jiki saw the man was slow and reckless as he sidestepped another wide strike and a frantic attempt to grab his hair, which caused him to twist his neck to the side. He ignored blocks and dodges in favor of hard blows and feints because of his illusory infinity, which bred an unjustified pride in him. Their scheme was really basic. Because of his ability to see his opponents, he was not only the fastest member of the clan, but also significantly faster than Satoru. They had so worn him out with a string of victories before putting him up against a bruiser. Jiki had to admit he never really expected to hit the elder man. His blows and attacks were designed to test the limits of his limitlessness, a boundless he discovered lacking. He leaped back once he had obtained all the necessary information. He had never been built for endurance, no matter how he timed himself. Here and in his former life, he was obviously exhausted from fighting eight fights in a row, and judging from the even harsher smile the man gave him, he was breathing heavily. Tired already? He let the elder man have his false confidence and disregarded his taunt. Without the assistance of the six eyes, his use of the neutral form of boundless was excellent very excellent. It wasn't flawless though. Without the extraordinary perception provided by the six eyes, his boundless could only divide so much space. This implied that something could only pass through his seeming impenetrable barrier to the extent that it could no longer be strengthened. In a way he had not done before, he relaxed his shape and sank his cursed energy into his body. His muscles and tendons were strengthened by the cursed energy he felt coursing through his skin and blood. The way it snaked around his bones and nerves calmed him and prepared them for what lay ahead. Few could match the improvements he had made to his body, but that was only to get ready for his real scheme. With a nonchalant gait, the man approached him. Satisfied with his conviction that he could not transcend the infinite without his manjiko, Jiki braced himself against the ground and sank into an even lower stance. When the elder man turned to face him, he was met with a broad haymaker that was intended to strike his skull. With this concentration, his sharingan anticipated the motion and he easily sidestepped the attack. Sensing the force of the step cracking the sparring ground, he sent his left foot forward with such seamless movement that he twisted his hips and used all the coiled momentum from his legs to his wounded knuckles into the most spectacular punch of his life. His opponent's response was to smile down at him as the punch landed on the imperfect infinity that separated them, stopping short of his chest by a few inches. Everything altered with the precise blast of cursed energy that occurred at the same moment the strike hit. He could sense the way the faulty unlimited strove to divide space until it finally couldn't, feeling the huge force of the blow hitting the infinite distance between him and his opponent. The amount of space that the instant limitless could divide was finite. It broke. Jiki was ready for the recoil even though it smacked him. His hair whipped back by the wind, he was obliged to take barely a step back, further cratering the ground. His opponent's only choice was to open his eyes and absorb the remaining half of the augmented blow's distributed force on his chest. Everything in its path was annihilated by the conical force that emerged from the impact. Only old man Tatsumi's hurriedly erected barrier prevented the onlookers from succumbing to his impressive display of strength as the arena collapsed just inches from him. He exhaled deeply and straightened his back before observing the outcome of his labor. 
While half of the arena was reduced to sand and rubble, the structure where the spar was taking place had collapsed inward, leaving a large portion missing. His attention was drawn to his right hand by a small tremor from his limbs. His right hand shook from the pain of stretched bones and torn muscles, it was not perfect, huh, he muttered to himself. He never bothered to achieve the level of conditioning needed for the improved strength approach, even with the reinforcement he applied. After his hair finally calmed in the breeze, it fell and stretched out across his back. His eyes searched and discovered the broken and still form half buried into the wall. He felt nothing. He looked back up, noting the terror and anguish that the onlookers directed at him. Old man Tatsumi said, winner Jiki, his straight face scarcely showing a hint of a smile. Against the mass of dust-caked humans, his untainted form was striking. Jiki gave him a courteous nod, then looked over at the elder's seat. They were the only other individuals who were completely protected from his harm, where the majority of them had expressions of thoughtfulness or respect. Especially one older woman gave him a stare full of venom. He dismissed the glance with a shrug and made his way off the broken platform. He'd destroyed a clan before, if he had to do it again, perhaps Sataru would even rejoice. Knock one more time. He shouted out, Jiki, come in and take a seat, as he continued to serve the tea he had just completed brewing. Jiki entered as the door opened. Tatsumi noticed that he was becoming less of a child with soft features, genuinely developing into his mother's more pointed features. His long, white hair fell in a ponytail down his back, revealing a serene expression. Had he not been here, he might have had trouble believing that he was the same guy who had shook the clan's foundations just 12 hours before. He was wearing black shorts and a matching pair of baggy long sleeves that covered his recently bandaged right hand. He had left his black slides at the door. Behind him trailed the gentle, dark-haired, amber-eyed figure of his maid turned seneschal. Despite her efforts to dress in the traditional black and white maid uniform every day, she was treated like a true maid by few in the clan. What captivated him was what she held in her hands. After taking a cup and sipping his own tea, he asked the child, you managed to finish it then, as he finally sat down across from him. The night before the forging, forgive me for not bringing it earlier. He dropped his teacup and glanced at the now smiling young kid, saying, enough with the overly formal pleasantries, brat. I'm no longer the clan head, we don't have to bother with that facade. I assume Aiko is the one carrying it because of your hand. As he raised the arm to gaze at it, the boy's smile gradually turned into a scowl. It's temporary, the technique still needs a bit of work. His arm trembled momentarily as a result of the slight movement, and his scowl deepened before becoming more normal. Jiki demonstrated a strength of arms that even he found difficult to wrap his head around thanks to another technique the child had invented in his spare time. If he continued at this pace, by the time he entered Jujutsu High, the youngster would be teaching his master's new techniques for using cursed energy. I'll give Shoko a callby. He gave the brat the stink eye, cleared his throat, and then started talking. You would go to her, even when I'm here. Unfortunately, I do not have any more six-year-olds to offer up as payment for your specific brand of healing. The child struck him with such an accusing tone that he nearly smashed the cup in his grasp. Instead, the normally composed teenager was compelled to glance aside and return his attention to his tea by his blank stare. Adolescence. He didn't hold the brat responsible, if he was being honest. His grasp on the teacup loosened, and he said, I do not regret it, you know, before glancing at the frozen woman standing behind Jiki. If we had to do it over again, I would make the same offer. And I know you will accept it once more. Hate me for that if you will. Back to his tea, he took another sip. He didn't hold the brat responsible for harboring resentment for so long. Despite his seeming maturity, what knowledge did he possess about leadership and the decline of his illustrious lineage? Observing the abrupt decline of a clan in a generation that was thought to be derived from Michizane Sugawara himself and had only one support system. He had recognized the opportunity to include an additional pillar, and today had unequivocally shown that he was correct. Jiki would be a good stand-in if something were to happen to Satoru. 
Whoever was the new clan chief would be responsible for anything that happened after that. He hoped the youngster would come to comprehend that eventually. The suspense was broken by a quiet voice saying, Tatsumi-san, your package. Glancing back up, he saw that this was the first time the girl had ever taken the lead in a conversation, and that she had intervened at such a low point in order to get Jiki's attention. Upon meeting his eyes, she withered and abruptly retreated behind the brat. In other news, Elder Kahori has requested you be punished for destroying a sacred heirloom of the clan, he stated, changing the topic of discussion from decisions made earlier. The tension was eventually released with a chuckle and a pout from the child. Any relation to the recently deceased Tanaka-san? He was her grandson, Tatsumi said, nodding in approval. Though he may not have enjoyed it much, the child understood clan politics better more than Satoru ever cared to learn or comprehend. I should be expecting some form of retaliation then? She wouldn't dare, not while I'm around, and not while Satoru is still the clan head. The child questioned, and the punishment. With his left hand as he picked up his cup, Tatsumi noticed. You'll have two days alone to reflect on your role in the demise of a devoted member of that tribe, he said, waving an exaggerated hand. Everyone was aware that Satoru's departure from the nation made the appearance of punishment, even if it was fictitious possible. The brat finished his tea, set it back on the table, and got up, saying, By your will then. He took the package from Eiko, held it in one hand, and then handed it to him. He gave her a submissive nod, swung around on his feet, and left, the maid following him like a permanent shadow. So this was the end of this movie. I hope you enjoyed it. To watch more movies like this, subscribe to my channel. Until then, we be off line.